we call the meeting to order at 6 p.m. And uh, before we get into the agenda, I'm going to turn it over to the general manager to see if there are any housekeeping items. Thank you, President Akbari. Yes, I have some initial remarks and really about um, you know um, conducting our Zoom virtual board meeting. First, good evening and thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, on behalf of the ACWD Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome the public's participation in this board meeting this evening. My name is Ed Stevenson and I serve as the ACWD's general manager. And in fact, I've been doing so for about six days now. Uh, members of the public may participate in this public meeting, either by using the Zoom application or by telephone. So if you're participating via Zoom, generally we ask that all participants mute their microphones unless speaking, and you may be placed on mute by the district secretary. The district secretary will unmute participants at the appropriate times when the board is receiving public comments. In Zoom, you'll be able to view the presentation materials as they're presented to the board. And at any time, you may submit a question or raise your hand in the Zoom app, and you'll be called upon at the appropriate time. If you are participating by a telephone audio, again, we ask that you put your phone on mute. Uh, you may review the presentation materials and the agenda, which have all been posted uh, to the district's website at www.acwd.org and follow along that way. And as you just saw, this Zoom webinar will be recorded and will be made accessible to the public for future viewing. The board will be working through a pretty full agenda this evening, and we will have up to two closed session items that will be covered near the end of the meeting. And while the board is convening into closed session, members of the public may remain logged into Zoom or stay on the phone to be informed of board reports once the closed sessions are concluded. Again, thanks everybody for attending and that completes my housekeeping remarks. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, can the district secretary please take roll call? Yes. Director Zweed? Here. Gunther? Here. Wong? Here. Steffi? Present. And Akbari. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, would you like to lead us in the salute to the flag? Oh, I'd be honored. Thank you. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Moving on to item number three, public comments. Members of the public may address the board on any issues not listed on the agenda, which are within the purview of the Alameda County Water District. A five minute limit is customary. However, the board president may adjust the actual time allotted to accommodate the number of speakers. Members of the public who wish to address the board on a scheduled agenda item will be given the opportunity to do so when we reach that item. Are there any members of the public who wish to make a public comment at this time? I am seeing no hands raised in the Zoom app and I am seeing nothing in the chat window. So we can uh, conclude the public comment section. And we're going to jump a little bit ahead in the agenda and move straight to item 5.7, a resolution, a resolution honoring Kathy Nelson upon her retirement from district service. And I will turn it to Mr. Stevenson for this item. Thank you, President Akbari. And, and I, um, I am pleased to read this staff report myself. Um, Ms. Nelson, uh, I believe is in the audience this evening and so um, I'm, I'm very happy to present this. Kathy Nelson will be retiring after more than 36 years of service with the district and her last day in the office will be August 6, 2021. Kathy joined the district as an engineering technician one on April 15, 1985, after having worked as a drafter for the engineering consulting firm Black & Veatch. Kathy was promoted to engineering technician two in June, 1986 and to Engineering Technician 3 in May of 1995. 
In August 2000, Kathy transferred to the district's Information Technology Division as an Information Systems Analyst II, administering the district's Geographic Information System. During her tenure as engineering technician, Kathy played a key role in several capital projects, including the Vineyard Heights Tank Project and other projects. Significantly, Kathy introduced computer-aided drafting and design and geographic information systems to the district. As an information systems analyst, Kathy implemented, developed, and administered the district's GIS system, which has now become critical to the operations of the district and its mission. Major contributions during her tenure include optimization of meter reading routes, implementation of InfraMap and mobile GIS for the distribution maintenance division field staff, and implementation of CityWorks work order management system for the distribution maintenance division. Kathy was a key contributor in evaluating, recommending, and deploying significantly improved rugged mobile computers to the, to the distribution maintenance division, and she maintained, provided, and integrated data supporting key district systems and processes, including the main cleaning program, the backflow prevention program, lead service line inventory, and service line replacements, CityWorks and Kayenta data integration, and AWWA water audits, tailored mailing lists, and GIS agenda mapping for the board's own board meetings. Over the course of her career, Kathy has consistently worked to expand GIS and related functionality throughout the district, playing critical roles in enhancing and maintaining the GIS system and related applications. And in addition, Kathy played a key pioneering role in the formation of the Southern Alameda County GIS Joint Powers Authority and in the development and implementation of the GIS technology shared by all of the participating agencies of the authority. Kathy's knowledge and skills have resulted in the development and implementation of the tools employees use to work more efficiently and produce high quality results every day. Kathy has consistently performed her duties with a high level of confidence, professionalism, integrity, and dedication. And she will be greatly missed by her many friends and colleagues at the district. And I include myself in that list. So staff's recommendation is by motion, adopt a resolution honoring Kathy Nelson and expressing appreciation for her 36 years of dedicated service to the district. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. And I'm very, very happy that Kathy Nelson was able to join us this evening. Um, are there any directors who would like to make any comments before we move to the resolution? I guess I can this go is, ahead. It, go ahead, Jim. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, Kathy, thank you so much. It, you know, it, it feels like just yesterday we were doing GIS. And I guess it wasn't just yesterday now. <laughs> so thank you so much for that service. You're, you're going to be missed. And, uh, you know, I appreciate, wish we weren't in COVID. You know, this is just not the same on Zoom. So who knows, maybe by August 6th, uh, there'll be some opening. But uh, anyway, thank you so much for your service. Thanks for the GIS stuff. That has been a great help to the district, as well as the local community. <clears throat> This is Director Sethi. Uh, Kathy, uh, my father started at the Water District in the Engineering Department in the early 60s as a draftsman. And uh, when he retired, uh, you took over the position that he held at the Water District. And I was so proud of my dad throughout his tenure at the Water District, I grew up with it. That's why I think I'm serving on the board today. I've loved the water district ever since being a child. And uh, <clears throat> having come to know you, um, I've come to respect you as an individual, all your contributions, your consistency and effort, and just being a consummate professional at everything that you do. And uh, I have served on the Southern Alameda County GIS uh, Joint Power Authority since 2011 spring 2011. And so I have come to know you in an indirect way uh, in your service to uh, that JPA, which serves the entire Tri-City area. 
And I think that you're going to leave a, a sincere legacy to your entire Tri-City community in terms of uh, everything that has been uh, contributed on your part to uh, that uh, very important but little noticed uh, board in, in our community. So I'm wishing you well in your future and all your future endeavors. And, uh, um, and I hope to see you around at some company picnics or Christmas uh, breakfast or something like that in the future. Please take care. Thank you. Director Akbari, President Akbari, may I? So Kathy, well, what can I say? First of all, on the GIS front, thanks for keeping me out of trouble by providing the monthly math so I know when to recuse myself. So great thanks to that. Secondly, I think you, you symbolize the dedication of an, our employees to customer service and to the district's mission. I had the great pleasure of talking to you just a few months ago uh, when you were out here providing technical support to the crews that's doing the dead end flushing. You not only spearheaded the GIS project, you actually go out in the field and provide technical support just to make sure that things are running the way it should be. I joke about perhaps my day job, the IT is way offshore. Our IT is close and personal. Things doesn't work, our people are there on the spot helping out, and that would be you. I had a great conversation with you. It's amazing how much knowledge you have in your head, not just in terms of IT, GIS, but actually what the crews were doing out there. <laughs> it is amazing to actually have a conversation with you, to, to actually learn about dedicated employees like you. I will definitely miss you. I thank you for all your contribution. And like what Director Sati said, please come by during the picnics and holiday party. I look forward to having more conversation with you. And sincerely, thank you from me for all your contribution. Have a great time in your new adventure. Well, Kathy, uh, John Weed, thank you for your service. It's an extraordinary length of time and you stayed up with the technology and was one of the uh, technology forefront for the district all the way into your last days. And that's remarkable. Um, I do hope you can take yourself off mute and make a few comments. <laughs> and, uh, and again, thank you for your service. Thank you so much for the kind words. And yeah, I, I did prepare something to say um, tonight because I did not at the, uh, the JPA board meeting which I regretted. So I do want to, um, to uh, read some things and I know it's a full agenda, so I'll, I'll try to keep it short here. So a um, little bit of history. I moved here from Colorado in 1984, go Broncos. I commuted from Fremont to Walnut Creek on BART, which took three hours out of my day. So of course I was thrilled when the retirement of director Sethi's father opened up a position for me to apply. Timing is everything. So my first project was to coordinate the headquarters move to our current building. I was the new person that didn't have any other assignments, so it made sense. So under the direction of Bill Blair, the move took place five months later in September of 1985. That project was great for me because I learned the district literally inside and out. And I was hired uh, as a drafter and my first, um, I drafted construction plans for numerous projects with pen and ink on Mylar. So I'll, I'll fill you in with a little bit of ancient history. So when drawing on Mylar, the oil from your arms and hands will get on the Mylar and consequently the ink won't stick to it. So you had to clean the Mylar. We, we used a, a cleaning liquid known as Bestine. So, well, while sifting through my paperwork in my office a couple of weeks ago, I came across a memo, oddly enough, I still had, that I had to send to the, um, all of the engineering technicians uh, back in 1987 about the use of Bestine. I had to advise them to not have the incandescent bulb on the drafting lights. We had incandescent and fluorescent ones. So don't have the, the incandescent bulb on the drafting lights turned on while cleaning the mylar because there's a high likelihood it could spontaneously combust. I'll let you figure out why I had to write that memo. 
So I was fortunate enough to have worked for Bill Blair. He spearheaded a lot of the new technology and he took me along for the ride. Or actually it's probably because he thought it was safer for me to use a computer. It was less chance of it going up in flames. The technology was just starting at the district when my career began and my knowledge grew as the number of computers grew. We had one IBM XT computer in 1985 and quickly added two more ATs to that. So Mr. Blair realized that when we needed this, that we needed the software to keep up and soon our presentations for the board meetings to start with began uh, to be created on the computer. The next logical step was for the construction drawings to be computerized and then CAD was on the scene at the district. I even worked on the SCADA projects drawings with the CAD. And being on the ground floor of the technology was really enjoyable because um, as Ed had mentioned, I had um, a, the good fortune to do the researching and comparing the software before we purchased it. Again, timing is everything. So then Mr. Blair uh, tapped me to bring GIS to the district around 1991. And that's when I knew for sure that I did have the best job at the district. It's because it's the best because I was able to work with every department and every section within each department. That's what GIS does. I think GIS is a tool that almost every aspect of the district benefits from. And I'm grateful to the board for being so supported of, supportive of the GIS and the uh, GIS JPA. And it has been amazing to be able to help my coworkers jobs easier, more efficient with the use of GIS. And at the time, nobody knew what GIS was, much less how it would help them with their work. So I was able to introduce them to the power of GIS. The project I'm, I'm particularly proud of is um, getting mobile GIS in the field for the distribution maintenance crews. Uh, the crews really had no interest in GIS or computers in general, but they have embraced GIS and CityWorks. And I can even get some of them to say they like it, albeit privately to me only. So 36 years is a long time and uh, it, it has flown by. There've been a lot of changes at the district during that time, including general managers. Um, Ed Stevenson is the sixth one since I started work here. I don't know how many people remember that Mr. Stevenson actually started at the district as a co-op student. I thought he was an intern, but he quickly reminded me that he was a co-op student. I don't remember what the difference is, but apparently there is one. But luckily we were able to snag him back from East Bay Mud. And um, I, I will miss not being able to experience his growth in his new challenge firsthand. But as much as I love the work I do, a lot of reason, uh, a lot of the reason that I've stayed so long is because of the people. I've developed, developed strong working relationships and also very deep friendships. And I'm going to miss seeing everybody on a daily basis, even though COVID tried to ease me into my retirement slowly. But luckily I'm a, I'm a customer, so I can keep tabs on people and projects. So I, I do, um, I happily relinquish the title of the longest tenured employee to um, the person, a person who started here as a WE student, which is a work experience education program for high school students. And then the number two person will, is also a WE student alum. So that is a testament that this is such a great place to work that nobody really wants to leave. So I thank you and I appreciate all of your kind words and I will be back. You haven't seen the last of me yet. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, you know, retirements are always a very bittersweet moment because it's, it's a time when we realize just how impactful each of our employees are and uh, what a challenge it's gonna be to fill those shoes. Um, and you certainly made that a unique challenge for us here. Uh, but we wish you well in retirement. I would love to know what are you looking forward to most once you, uh, once you embark on retirement? Actually, I'm looking forward to spending uh, time with my grandson. They used to live with me and they have moved up north. So um, I miss him terribly, well, along, along with his parents. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so I'll be spending a little bit more time um, up there and also spending more time uh, volunteering at the Humane Society of Silicon Valley. That's, that's where my passion lies, actually. 
well, we wish you the absolute best in, in retirement. And, and we've heard it from you already, but we, we would love to see you again. Um, so I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure we will. Yes. Um, Thank you. I will turn it to the directors if there's a motion on the table for a resolution. I'll make the motion. I'll uh, second. Great. Roll call, please. Director Swede. Aye. Gunther. Aye. Wong. Aye. Steffi. Aye. And Aquari. Congratulations again, Kathy. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, your response, Director Aquari. Aye. No, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I think maybe I'm having some uh, some audio issues today, um, but I will. I'll try to speak up. All right, so we will now uh, move back up on the agenda and we have a special order of business uh, to discuss the district's potential acquisition of the N3 ranch. And I will turn it to our general manager for this item. Thank you, President Akbari. Uh, before we step into the presentation, I'll turn it over briefly to our general counsel, Pat Miyaki, to provide a brief comment. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Stevenson. I just wanted to report that after the June 24th special board meeting, I evaluated whether any confidential closed, closed session information was disclosed by any member of the public or any member of the board. And I determined that no confidential closed session, closed session information was disclosed because everything that was said during that meeting is publicly available information. So I just wanted to report that for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miyaki. So I'll, I'll ask um, our district secretary to pull up the presentation materials. And I'll just mention that this is an item that was requested to be placed on the agenda by ACWD directors. Uh, and so that we could have a public discussion about ACWD's efforts to potentially acquire the N3 ranch property. So next slide, please. So this is just an overview of what we'll talk about. We'll review um, some information about the N3 Ranch property to kind of reorient ourselves with regard to the, the property and um, what it's about. And then we'll talk about ACWD's own interests associated with the N3 Ranch property. We'll talk about potential costs and risks to the district and, and the district's ratepayers. And then we'll have an opportunity to hear from the public and um, allow the board to have some discussion about the prospect of ACWD or, um, continuing to pursue uh, the purchase of the N3 Ranch and provide direction to staff on the way forward. So next slide, please. So the ranch consists of 50,500 acres. It's 131 parcels. And it's a, a massive property, spans four counties. And you can see the acreages here, Santa Clara County, Alameda County, San Joaquin County, and Stanislaus County. The property was originally listed for sale in the summer of 2019. And the, the asking price at that time was 72 million. It was more recently listed at an asking price of 68 million. So the current, um, the website for the broker that is um, uh, handling this property currently lists the property as sale pending, which generally means that there's some sort of contract perhaps un, um, uh, underway that uh, involves purchase of the property by an entity. Um, next slide, please. So the, the property has historically been used as a cattle ranch um, there have been um, um, a number of uh, agreements with cattle ranchers to um, use portions of the property and the owners have used the property for cattle operations. Uh, the property is enrolled in the Williamson Act. There are no conservation easements that are encumbering the property currently. And in terms of physical improvements, there are around 200 miles of private roads uh, and associated drainage facilities and bridges and so forth. Um, and then the property has a, about nine inholdings where um, properties sort of islands within the larger property are owned by others. 
And importantly, particularly for ACWD, the property spans portions of four sub watersheds. And we'll show you a little bit more about that in the next slide, please. So on this slide, we can see the N3 Ranch property outlined in red, um, overlaid on the Alameda Creek watershed, which is outlined in, in black. And within the Alameda Creek watershed, you can see uh, a number of what, what we call sub watersheds, areas that collect the drainage from these land areas to uh, water bodies. And if we move to the next slide, we'll be able to see that um, the overall breakdown of the area of the property by watershed, you know, the majority of the, of the property is within the Arroyo del Val watershed. And that's an important watershed for ACWD given that um, it serves, it feeds into Del Val Reservoir, which is one of our important sources of supply. But also the um, Arroyo Mocho, it's about seven and a half percent of the N3 ranch is within the Arroyo Mocho watershed. That um, Arroyo feeds into Alameda Creek and about 11% feeds into Upper Alameda Creek watershed and about you know, a little under a half a percent feeds into San Antonio Creek, also feeding into the Alameda Creek. You know, a fair amount, about 27% is, is outside the ACWD watershed. And the reason that's important um, is shown on the next slide. And that is because about 40% of ACWD's overall water supply portfolio is derived from the Alameda Creek watershed. And the other, the other sources are the Delta at about 40% and the San Francisco regional water system at about 20%. So the N3 Ranch is a significant part of the Alameda Creek watershed. So it totals you know, over 12% of the overall ACWD watershed. And it's thereby, um, also a, a significant part of ACWD's water supply in the watershed that serves roughly 40% of our um, system demands. Uh, next slide, please. So let's take a quick look at the district's own interests associated with the N3 Ranch property. Really the district's primary interests are watershed protection and that's based upon the um, location and the, the magnitude of this property within ACWD's watershed or the watershed that serves uh, much of ACWD's sources of supply. And so that includes um, preservation of the water itself. Um, our interests include water quality protection. We want to ensure that whatever happens with this watershed uh, is going to maintain the quality of the water that ultimately serves the district and our customers. And then the preservation of the open space is an interest of the district and importantly, environmental protection as well. So the district has worked with other entities as we have um, entertained approaches toward trying to protect the N3 ranch. Um, the, the overall objectives of the folks we've been working with have to do with protecting and preserving the property um, watershed protection very much in line with the district's own interests and potential development of the property as a park. Uh, next slide, please. So with regard to water rights on the property, really they're, they're minimal in terms of actual water rights that are available to the property. There are some minor water rights that are registered with the state that are associated with springs and, and ponds. And, and when I say minor, I'm really talking about uh, single digit to low double digit uh, gallons per day. So they're very uh, little in the way of true water rights associated with the property. And then um, if there were some relocation of water rights on the property, uh, they would be subject to the no injury rule such that, you know, other water rights holders and folks that may be impacted by uh, relocation of water rights um, 
couldn't be harmed by such an action. Um, and then just to confirm, and these are from our, our, uh, our water rights attorney, <clears throat> based upon some initial discussions early on when, when the district was evaluating potential interest in the property. Um, so <clears throat> water rights associated with any reservoir say that were constructed on the property by others, they would be junior to the rights that already exist for Alameda County Water District and Zone 7 Water Agency for um, the water that's within Alameda Creek and Del Val Reservoir. So really the water rights are kind of a minor issue related to uh, the N3 property. Next slide, please. Water quality protection is of course important. And so, you know, as I mentioned, the property has been used for cattle ranching operations for uh, many decades actually, and ensuring that any such cattle impacts um, are managed really could have a beneficial impact on downstream water quality, which is of course important, not only for ACWD, but also for others on the South Bay Aqueduct, which is tied to the um, Del Val Reservoir. Development on the property is, um, is always a concern, but I just wanted to point out that, um, if the, that if there were proposals or plans to develop the property, they would be subject to limitations on density and development impact, um, like Alameda County Measure D, and they would have to be in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act. And of course, the district would have an option to, um, to comment on any sort of CEQA analyses done with, associated with any sort of development on the property. So it would have to be pretty low density and it'd have to be pretty low impact if the property were developed. Also with regard to water quality, um, as you saw much of the property drains to Del Val Reservoir or Lake Del Val, which is um, already a 50% recreation um, facility. In other words, its purpose is basically 50% recreation. Um, and um, in the course, Del Val is being operated as really as a recreational um, facility from that standpoint, also as a water supply and flood control facility. But, um, but as a recreational facility, it, it already allows power boats and body contact, recreation, swimming, and so forth. Next slide, please. So this is important. The property, as I mentioned, is, is currently listed as sale pending, uh, which again, likely means that there's already another um, contract in play. But the district is considering submitting what we call a backup offer which could be considered should any current pending sale not be consummated, right? It's not uncommon that a sale of a property like this, which would be uh, very complex, um, it's possible that it may not go through. Uh, so if the district's backup offer were ultimately accepted, that, um, potential sale to the district could help meet the district's own objectives. And we've talked a little about that and the objectives of other interests, um, you know, provided that those objectives are in alignment and talked a little bit about how those objectives generally may be in alignment. Okay, next slide, please. All right. Um... So for this one, yeah, I'll turn it over to our manager of finance, John Wonderlich. Great, thank you, Mr. Stevenson. So uh, what we've gone ahead and done is, is we've prepared a few different financial scenarios uh, for district participation in a purchase. Uh, as Mr. Stevenson referenced, there are other potential partners with various interests. So there are a lot of possibilities uh, of how this could play out for the district. And so what, we'll, uh, what we've done is prepared a few scenarios that try to kind of give the low and high ends of what that could look like. Uh, but first, some of our key assumptions. Uh, we have uh, assumed that the purchase would be 68 million because that is the list price. Uh, but obviously any actual price would be negotiated. Uh, we are assuming that the annual net 
O&M cost for the property, the entire property would be about $3 million per year. Uh, we think that this is a feasible yet cost conscious approach um, that does assume some modest revenue from cattle grazing, but does not consider the full range of potential revenue generating opportunities for a property like this. Uh, there is significant uncertainty in the amount of funding that might be contributed by partners. Um, and what we've assumed as will be shown on the next slide is that, you know, kind of the more that ACWD would contribute toward a purchase, the more we would likely be responsible for ongoing O&M because that may suggest uh, a greater uh, portion of ownership of the property. Uh, we have had uh, recent conversations with our financial advisor as recent as yesterday, and they've advised that in current market conditions, uh, we could get a rate as low as 2.3% on 30 year fixed rate bonds. Obviously, by the time the district would get to a financial market to issue bonds, uh, the rates would be different than they are today, but that's uh, what our advisor has suggested uh, could be available today. And then in terms of uh, determining what the potential rate impact of our participation would be uh, as a general rule of thumb, a 1% rate impact correlates to about 1.2 million in revenue. Next slide. Okay, so the first scenario we evaluated was a, a 5 million contribution toward uh, a purchase along with 1 million in annual O&M this is consistent with the assumptions that were included in the budget recently adopted by the board. And it does correlate to about a 1% rate impact, which is already factored into the district's financial planning. Uh, so this is kind of the status quo in terms of our financial plan. The second scenario we evaluated was a 50% contribution toward the purchase or 34 million, uh, and then 2 million in annual O&M. Uh, based on the financing assumptions that were presented, this would result in a $1.6 million annual debt service payment. Uh, you combine that with the $2 million in annual O&M, and that's uh, approximately a 3% rate impact, which would be 2% above current planning. And then the final scenario uh, that was evaluated is the full purchase price in the full $3 million in annual O&M expenditures. And so that would lead to a $3.2 million annual debt service payment. Uh, when added, uh, when you add the 3 million in annual O&M to that, that equates to a 5.2% rate impact or 4.2% above current planning. And again, under scenarios uh, two or three, which would add uh, additional costs compared to the district's current financial plan, uh, because the district is currently in a situation where it has reserves above the board targets, uh, we would have the flexibility to phase in any uh, rate increase associated with this over several years. Uh, so this shouldn't be interpreted as, you know, next year there will be an additional uh, rate increase of the amounts indicated. It would be phased in over several years. Uh, next slide. And then uh, what we also wanted to show is what our debt coverage ratios would look like. And so what we're comparing here is uh, our adopted budget or status quo financial plan, those are the bars in blue. And in orange are the bars based on a full $68 million bond issuance for a full purchase, as that would have the biggest impact on our debt coverage ratio. And as you can see, um, with the full purchase, our debt coverage ratio does stay at close to 300%. And so it does stay above the board policy target of 200%. All right, uh, next slide. And then I, I believe I'll be turning it back to Mr. Stevenson for the uh, remainder of the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Wonderlich. So just a, a quick overview of other risks that could be presented to the district um, related to purchase of the property, really focusing here on business, what we call business risks. Um, you know, should the district work to purchase the property and then engage with others to potentially um, purchase portions of the property or property rights in order to meet their needs, 
we would call that a takeout. Um, and uh, if we were to um, go down a, a, a process like that, there are some risks associated with that, that perhaps those takeouts may take quite a bit of time and, and likely would be um, something that would take some time. And the district would then, of course, have to carry the costs that Mr. Wunderlich talked about for that period of time that would be required until the district could complete such takeouts or, or purchases by others. Uh, and of course, um, the district, if uh, the district retained all or a portion of the pro of property, um, there would be those O&M costs that uh, Mr. Wunderlich talked about. And, and I, again, I just want to emphasize that those are very much estimates at this point for sort of financial analysis purposes and um, haven't been detailed out yet. Um, other risks include, you know, the con condition of the property itself. Uh, the property has been significantly impacted by the SCU Lightning Complex fire. We do know that. Um, there are um, obviously 131 parcels. Uh, the title reports are extensive. And given the age of the property and the various activities on the property over time, um, the condition of title is um, always a question. The presence of hazardous materials and other liabilities associated with taking ownership of the property are there, but those would be further evaluated in due diligence should the district make an offer and should such an offer be accepted. Next slide, please. So again, really the purpose of this presentation was to um, share this information with the board and the public to ensure that um, uh, that it serves as a basis of some discussion. We're interested in input from the public and we're interested in discussion from the board and from staff standpoint, really what we're interested in is receiving uh, direction from the board in terms of whether to continue to pursue acquisition of the property or, or not to do that. So um, just before though we turn it over for discussion, I did, did wanna mention that we have, the district has been receiving input from the public <clears throat> um, over the last several days. Um, and as of about 5.15 this evening, and I'm, I'm looking at my emails and I'm seeing we just received another, but as of about 5, uh, 5.45 actually this evening, uh, we'd received a total of 28 emails. Um, all were in support of the district's potential acquisition of the N3 property. None were opposed to the prospect of the district um, pursuing acquisition of the property. And the comments provided centered mostly on preservation of open space, um, preventing development in urban sprawl, and protecting the environment, and, and really encouraging recreational use and public access. Two of those emails were clearly from ACWD customers living within our service area. Um, and that's based upon addresses and city information provided. 14 of those emails were clearly from outside the district service area, from others um, around the Bay Area and so forth. Um, and the 12 emails didn't include information to be able to ascertain where they came from. So I just wanted to share that. Um, for those folks who have sent those messages to the district, uh, they have been forwarded to the board. Um, they've been coming in fast and furious. And so I'm not certain that all the directors have been able to read through every one, but they've been forwarded. So with that, um, President Akbari, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Um, so I am going to open this up for comments from the public, and we will be asking all of our members of the public to limit their comments to about three minutes. And I believe the district secretary will be able to, to put a clock up um, to show you how much time is left. So with that, uh, we'll open this up for public comment. Uh, please use the Zoom app to raise your hand or leave a comment in the chat, letting us know that you'd like to make a comment. I see Jean King, floor is yours. 
Hi, that was really fast. I'm Jean King. I live in Livermore, California. I think this is a wonderful opportunity that won't come very often. It sounds very complicated and involved, but I hope that you will pursue it and work on it for all the uh, reasons, recreation, water quality, saving that open space. So continue to work on it, and I hope that you do purchase it. And thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you so much for your comment. Any other members of the public who wish to make a comment? Uh, yeah, this is Jeff Miller. Can you hear me? Yeah, Jeff Miller. Uh, good evening, uh, board members. Jeff Miller, director of the Alameda Creek Alliance. You can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear okay, you. Great, great. Um, thanks for the opportunity to comment on this. and. I just want to start off by congratulating Ed Stevenson um, for your appointment to general manager and uh, look forward to working with you on, on all the, uh, the water supply and, and uh, fish restoration initiatives. So congratulations. Um, yeah, I, we, um, speaking on behalf of our members, many of whom live in the Alameda Creek watershed, including um, many who are, who are ACWD um, ratepayers. And um, we do strongly support the ACWD purchase of the N3 Ranch. Um, this is a significant chunk of the upper Alameda, Alameda Creek watershed, and it does contain some important um, uh, large um, contiguous uh, wildlife habitat. And obviously, you know, your interest is, is the fact that this property is in the watersheds that, that um, drain down to um, critical water supply facilities, including Lake Del Val, Calaveras Reservoir, and Alameda Creek itself. Um, and I think, I, my understanding, this is the largest current land holding for sale in California. And this is a pretty, um, this would be a pretty, pretty significant conservation uh, effort if this land was purchased by a public agency and protected for, for wa uh, water supply, water quality, and uh, public open space. Uh, you know, the fact that there is already an offer and we don't really know um, uh, who the potential buyer is, I think the threat of development is real, even, even with the, um, the limited development, the fact that there's 131 parcels on this property is a little concerning, um, you know, the kind of, the kind of uh, trophy home mega developments that, that you see. Um, we, we certainly are in the orbit of Silicon Valley and there would be people willing to um, purchase <clears throat> those kind of remote properties. Um, and uh, also, I know there was a consortium of state and local agencies that were working together to try to purchase this property. And I'm not sure the particulars, but obviously there, there's a lot of challenges with that. And um, that doesn't seem to have come together. So it seems, seems that if the water district is, is situated to um, make this purchase, um, it, it, should, it should move on it. Um, it would have a lot of public benefits. Um, obviously, this is land that could potentially be open to hiking or camping or other recreation for the general public. Um, a good model is the kind of partnership with the East Bay Regional Park District that you've got. Well, you know, you currently operate Cory Lakes Park under, I know I know East Bay Parks and SFPC and, and the state and other um, public land agencies are very interested in protecting a lot of these lands also. And that was mentioned in Can terms of- seconds remaining, sorry. Okay, um, just to sum up, I do think it makes sense for for the public to own these watershed lands and for ACWD, which has a vested interest in protecting the water quality um, to work with other, to work to manage this with other public agencies for the public benefit and recreation. And thanks, thanks very much for, for looking into this. Thank you for your comments. Uh, any other members of the public? Uh, Ken N, floor is yours. Thank you, President Akbari. <laughs> The district is considering spending $68 million of ratepayer funds to purchase the N3 cattle ranch. ACWD is a water district, not a park district or open space district. As President Akbari writes, its mission is clear, provide high quality, reliable supply of water at a reasonable cost. I ask, is this purchase the best use of these funds? Staff analysis shows that there are minimal water rights associated with this property and any reservoir constructed would, would result in water rights junior to zone seven. In other words, ACWD ratepayers would pay to give zone seven water. By the way, this reservoir would require the construction of the so-called upper dam as described by Director Weed in his soliloquy of October 17, 2019, at an additional cost of hundreds of millions of ratepayer dollars and inundating thousands of acres of the Arroyo del Val watershed. 
large swaths of Delta Valley Regional Park would also be flooded. I doubt such a reservoir would ever be built. Though the district does obtain 40% of its supply from the Alameda Creek watershed, the impact of acquiring N3 and allowing it to go fallow are minimal. Del Val already traps sediment, and the present mixed use of Del Val is the dominant factor in downstream water quality. So is this the best way to spend $68 million? If water supply is the issue, wouldn't participating in Los Vaqueros be a far more cost-effective route? As far as water quality, investment in the removal of PFAS and other emerging contaminants of concern has a much more direct beneficial impact to ACWD customers. Do we intend to keep on diluting with hyper expensive SFPUC water just to remain just under the reporting limit? Paying down OPEB would provide the ratepayers with a lasting benefit rather than saddling us with a perpetual 6% rate hike. Maybe we should invest in water recycling. Our droughts are becoming more frequent and persistent. We could fund replacement of landscaping with drought tolerant designs, permanently increasing supplies for critical needs. We could accelerate re replacement of aging water mains. The list goes on. The risks, on the other hand, are substantial. There is no assurance that other agencies would contribute to the purchase. If the so-called backup offer is accepted, the district could be left holding the bag for the entire ranch. How do you know that there isn't a hazmat dump on the site? The $3 million figure for O&M has already increased by 50% from the last time the analysis was performed. It's likely to go higher, further adding to the impact on water rates. N3 has been under consideration for nearly two years, the board meeting in secret over 20 times to figure out how to put lipstick on this pig. Now, in a seemingly desperate move, after finding the ranch has gone into contract, the district wants to put over $100 million of rate care funds over the next 20 years into what? A trophy? The board has a responsibility to spend ratepayer funds prudently, and I do not see how this proposed purchase meets that test. Thank you. Okay. Just made it in the nick of time. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Nishimura. I think uh, Mr. Suresh Passage uh, is up next. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm, my name is Suresh Passage. I live in Fremont and I have lived here for close to 30 years. I think the previous speaker actually spoke to most of the points that I'm going to speak. And I'm actually uh, not surprised that most of the feedback, that written feedback that came uh, in support of this uh, gigantic purchase is from people who are not the rate payers, who are outside the ACWD area. You know, of course, uh, they are not affected if our rates go up by five or 6%. Um, and as the previous speaker said, the ACWD has made no attempt to look at alternatives, whether it's be recycling or other ways to reduce consumption. Um, and that's very disappointing. This report that has been published or presented today is really very one-sided and, uh, you know, just to have a trophy and then we are all hit with a 6% rate increase is not appropriate. And I don't know exactly why it is being rushed. This is the first time public has been given any opportunity to make comments on it. And as the previous speaker said, so far everything was being done in secret and I'm really disappointed. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Mr. Kelly A. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to uh, recreation, the best uh, model is not Quarry Lakes, which uh, is, is situated in downtown Fremont. It's something more like uh, East Bay Mud and uh, East Bay Regional Park District in Orinda, where they uh, collaborate to run uh, 90 miles of trails around San Pablo Reservoir. And people are required to pay $10 a year for some kind of a fee so they can hike around. And the police are out there giving them tickets in case they don't have the proper hiking fee or hiking permit or whatever it is. I, that, I've never understood that. Of course, maybe I should go there and, and hike around and then I would understand maybe. Um, as far as the development, uh, people, I think there's a history of that. Uh, this coastal range area, south of Livermore, east of Morgan Hill, east of Milpitas, and west of Patterson is known as the coastal range. Um, there is already a, a history of development in these foothills. One is called Diablo Grand near Patterson with uh, one or two golf courses and hundreds of units of luxury housing uh, nestled in a scenic uh, uh, mountain valley. 
um, quite a history there. Uh, take, go out and take a look. You'll see um, some uh, a luxury development right there. Um, the Anderson Dam is now being rebuilt for the next 10 years uh, at, a, at a cost of uh, $600 million or whatever it is. That is the sort of storage project that that is uh, going on in these coastal range. There are so many storage projects and dam projects in this coastal range. The Pacheco Dam, 140,000 acre feet at something like two or $3 billion for, uh, sponsored by Santa Clara Valley. The raising of the um, Ed, Edmund, the Sisk Dam, the San Luis Reservoir with another 100,000 acre feet um, is, is being contemplated down there. The um, the Calaveras Dam, people don't know, has another 300,000 acre feet of potential additional storage that could be uh, sponsored by SFPUC. By the way, SFPUC doesn't allow people to hike around in the in the hills there, which is a very sad thing. They should allow it more. Um, and uh, that, so the Calaveras Dam, another opportunity. And um, um, there was one more. Oh, Del Puerto. Del Puerto Dam five miles west of Patterson, uh, 30 miles southeast of Livermore, is scheduled to begin construction next year. It's, al it's already in the environmental permitting phase, scheduled to, take, uh, to be uh, constructed That's between 2022 amazing. and 2028, 85,000 acre feet, another massive dam storage project in the coastal range. So I'd say that um, whatever a water agency does in here, uh, there's plenty of precedent. You can do whatever you want. And uh, following the model of any one of these uh, agencies that are all investing massive amounts of money. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other members of the public? Gina. Uh, uh, Mr. Kohler. Yes. Uh, my name is Martin Kohler. I've been a resident of Fremont for the past 54 years. I'm a former, former board member, 16 years with ACWD. Uh, I said a couple of other things that I'm also a retiree from Union Sanitary at 35 years uh, with Union Sanitary District in operations and maintenance. I support the ACWD purchasing of the N3 branch in order to do these things. It protects and preserves the property for the general environmental protection. It provides us with a watershed protection program, the water preservation and better water supply management of Lake DeVal, including the re-operation of the reservoir at a higher capacity. Also important is the water quality protection, open space preservation. On this last point, I would encourage the development of the certain portions of the land for parks so that we can open this private property to the Bay Area. Uh, provide public uh, for the recreation, hiking, fishing, and other activities. As a longtime ACWD customer, I'm willing to accept a slight increase in my water bill to support this purchase. Thank you for considering my thoughts. Thank you for your comments. Any other members of the public who wish to make a comment? Again, please raise your hand using the Zoom app or drop a note in the chat that you would like to make a comment. Hearing none, and I'll check with the district secretary. Is there anybody else in the chat who has identified that they would like to make a comment? Not at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, I will now open it up for board discussion. Is there any director who would like to get us started? Well, I guess I can break the ice. Okay. Um, this was, it's been around for a couple of years now, including my election. So most of my opinions are well known. Um, I support a purchase by a public agency. I support uh, multiple use by public agency. Um, I have continued to, I'm not a big advocate of building dams out there. I, I don't think the water's there. Um, 
At this point, I would say I would oppose building a dam out there. I never wanna say never. However, I, I really strongly oppose trying to build a dam out there. I think the cost is way too cost effective, uh, cost prohibitive, um, but never say never. However, I think for the watershed and the environmental protection aspects of this, the project is worth it. And if ACWD has to take the lead, I'm willing to make that effort. Yes, there are definitely potential risk involved with this. There would be potential risk with ACWD going in alone. Um, I concur with that. Uh, I would prefer not to be in that situation. However, if that's the situation that puts us in, I'm willing to do that. I think. I strongly feel, I don't think, I strongly feel that the other agencies or other agencies would support us in our endeavor and we could get some financial assistance. Actually, I don't think could, we will. I strongly think they will. With that said, I would support ACWD moving forward if with a backup offer as identified. Um, we have been talking about this for probably two years. Very, I've spoke about it several times in the election, public uh, discussions. Has it been in secret? It's been in closed session because it's been a property purchase. We have not been able to talk about it. This is not something the board has been trying to do in secret. I just want to make that well known to the public. We've not been trying to pull anything over the public's eyes. We talked about it several years ago, openly, went into public, went into the discussions, and yes, we've been required to be in closed session. And if we do this, we're going to have to go back to closed session. Um, it's just the way the laws are written, and making a purchase out in the wide open is not the way to do it. Nobody's going to buy a house and walk up to the owner and say, oh yeah, by the way, all of my negotiation is going to be over here on the table. You get to do everything you want close, but I have to disclose all mine. My offer, my status, um, it's not how it's done. So it would have to go back to closed session. It's been in closed session. I believe it's properly in closed session and I would support what the staff has put before us this evening. It would in all likely have, would at this point have to be a backup offer. I support that. So I support it, water quality, environmental uh, concerns. And there are other issues out there I think that um, could assist the district in making the property purchase uh, less significant. Thank you. Thank you, Director Gunther. I think uh, Director Weed, I heard you. Okay, thank you. You know, 18, uh, in October of 2019, over 21 months ago, we had the opportunity at this board to vote on it. I thought we had the votes and overnight two votes were flipped. And it was a three to two against purchase. We went into a rabbit hole with all these other park districts and the consortium. There was some political pressure. We had Secretary Crowfoot uh, of uh, Natural Resources uh, Department come down to, to promote a state park. After all this time, they were not able to execute. We have the money to do it. We have the money to buy it and we should do so. And we've collected more money in the interim because we've had a good water years and rate and, um, within the district and revenue flows. It's been the issue and the reason I have for it is water supply, not listed in our uh, elements and it's a valid reason. Water conservation, et cetera, it's hard to justify it. But we're in preparing to spend up to $20 million per thousand acre feet of storage. Los Vaqueros is an example of that, $98 million in our CIP for 5,000 acre feet of storage. Del Val, the dam is already built and 
there. It's plumb to the delta, and it can provide 50 to 60,000 acre feet. It will take us over a billion dollars to replicate what currently exists and is not being used at Del Val because of the way they put the recreational facilities at the bottom of the reservoir, arguing that it's easier to put parking lots at the bottom of a reservoir rather than on the edge. You can still maintain the 50% recreation through the reoperation of the reservoir. The upper dam that was discussed was, a, there was a discussion and proposal by CDM Corporation in 2010, about 12 years ago, in one of their reports, and they showed how expensive it was. One of the, I'm not supporting an upper dam. What I am supporting is flood control structures and sediment capture facilities in the watershed. Ironically, that could be done with either private or public ownership, and we can work out and achieve the reoperation of Del Val. But hopefully we can do it much better and much more authority and assurance. If it's a public agency, a public water district. When we talk about the cost, the cost of operating a park is many times that of operating a watershed. And the $3 million estimate is for a park operation. It was not based on what San Francisco is spending per acre on the adjoining uh, 38,000 acres that they own in Alameda County. And not directly adjoining, they're very close by. For the security of the Bay Area and water supply, we should reoperate Del Valle. Santa Clara, which is one of the South Bay contractors, is in desperate shape now, and they would not be if we had the proper operation planning for the Del Valle Reservoir. Recently, the East Bay Regional Park District had a ribbon cutting for the third visitor center that has twice been flooded out because much of his visitor center is located in a place during wet years, it gets flooded. And they keep rebuilding to plant themselves in more or less an anti-development, anti-growth area, limiting the water supply to the Bay Area, unnecessarily so. I would hope that we would proceed on our own and do this with a backup offer. And second, I would hope that regardless of whether we purchase it or that the private purchase goes through or not, that we actively pursue the reoperation of Del Val Reservoir, for which we at one time we had a $100 million Prop 1 proposal put forward that died because it really is cost effective to the district at a 10 to 1. When you look at the cost of the land per unit, we're at about $1,300 per acre foot at the asking price. Zone 7 purchased 5,000 acres in two parcels near Lake Del Val for $20 million three times more per acre, with the hopes of being able to work and develop it. Watershed is best owned by water districts and you can have parks use it, et cetera, but the control of your water supply is important. And tragically, it has not been part of our water, uh, the ACWD or uh, planning and it, or nor the state planning and operations, and it should be. Thank you. Thank you, Director Weed. Director Sethi, I'll go next. Floor is yours. Thank you. So let me cite a little bit of uh, history here for the public because I think there's some misperceptions about how we've been conducting ourselves as a board. This property initially came to market in July of 2019. Only a couple of weeks later, at our subsequent regular monthly board meeting for ACWD under director's comments, I suggest I first highlighted that the property was on the market. Second, that knowing what our forefathers would have done in the past and knowing all but two of our general managers and more than half of all the board members that have served on this board among 34, I knew instinctively, this is what our forefathers would have done. Um, Morris Hyman, uh, founder of Fremont Bank, Gene Rhodes, longtime politician, councilman, Fremont mayor. The two of them were the attorneys for the water district for 40 years from 1954 to 1994. 
until Hanson Bridget took over. They were, along with Matt Whitfield and other directors, the architects of securing uh, in 1962, being the first customer, first investor in Lake Oroville and the construction of the dam and having an additional water supply, which today represents about 40% of our water supply coming through the Delta. In 64, they worked with Governor Pat Brown and secured water, uh, uh, that was 62. In 64, they secured the water supply from Hetch Hetchy, which today represents 20% of our water supply. So I proposed in that August meeting, my third point, that <clears throat> we explore putting a option to buy on the entire property. And I said that we needed to move quickly. Time was of the essence and there needed to be a sense of urgency within the water district. We then went through four months of public hearings, sometimes twice a month. So to answer Mr. Suresh, uh, we had lots of public input during the fall of 2019. And we uh, had people who were advocating for the outright purchase by ACWD, as well as uh, uh, trying to look at working with a partnership. We then met with Secretary Crowfoot, or the board decided to go down the path of uh, uh, working with a coalition of partners. And in October of 2019, I wrote a memo to the board and staff and I said, if we went down that path, quote, it would be a long convoluted process that would end up with nothing. And uh, that we needed, quote, to be in charge of our own destiny. Be in charge of our own destiny. But we, uh, as a board, decided to move down the path of working with the coalition of partners and we met with Secretary Crowfoot in December. I representing the proponent side of the argument to purchase the land and uh, at the time President Wong uh, uh, being the chief of our board. And we uh, explicitly had decided uh, as a board that the most important thing if we moved forward as a coalition with a coalition of partners was that we have a governing structure. And that's what we communicated to Secretary Crowfoot. Whether it was uh, some form of JPA or government participants uh, to represent the property, it was very important to us that if the property was acquired, that we have the ability to have public input on something that's gonna be around for the next couple of hundred years. Well, we had uh, two of the environmental groups spearheading our coalition of partners. Beginning early last year, they said a deal is imminent. Every single month, they said it's around the corner. It never was. I argued that we were 180 degrees apart because we were not willing to accept what the seller's considerations were. And so, and we never set a deadline for going to a plan B. So we were strung along all year long and then into this year, uh, uh, biding our time, knowing full well that another offer could come in on the table. And that there, there are billion dollar sophisticated Silicon Valley buyers that certainly would like to have a trophy ranch. And there are developers that are looking out not around the corner, but 50 years into the future for development purposes. And with all the new technology that's coming about that can provide aerial uh, uh, flight over the hills from Intel headquarters in, in Santa Clara, straight over the mountains in 10 minutes, you're home. We already have helicopter pads up here in the hills. Go up to the top of uh, Mill Creek Road and you'll see executives coming in by helicopter. This is not out of the question. We've got 131 parcels here 
that certainly could be subdivided or sold off individually as parcels. So the window of opportunity closed on us and an offer came in five weeks ago and here we are in emergency mode trying to uh, regain our interest and make sure that we honor the commitments that we made to some of these other coalition partners. <clears throat> but there is only one single Bay Area agency that can act swiftly right now because we have the financial strength and the financial capability to move forward quickly. And so I urge our board and I thank the public for supporting us uh, so that we move or at least give direction to staff that we wish to pursue this as earnestly as possible, even as a backup offer, backup offers can still be negotiated too. And so I would urge staff to, uh, uh, in an expeditious way, get that backup offer, which is already prepared by our legal team and get it to the broker. Lastly, I wanna say this for the public, and I've said it in multiple meetings in fall of 19, and in two financial workshops last year. This is a manageable deal for us. It's manageable for the ratepayers who have to support this deal. If we go forward, we not only have the ability to make an all cash offer right now, but pay ourselves back with 30 year bonds Today, the 30-year treasuries were down at 1.925. And as you heard from Mr. Wunderlich, a 30-year bond moving forward right now is at 2.3% or below. Th these are historically low interest rates. You can't even get a mortgage on your home at those rates. But there is demand for these bonds right now. And we need to secure this for future generations not only in our Tri-City area, but for the broader Bay Area community. We're getting a really good price on the purchase of this property. And as Mr. Wunderlich also pointed out, we can spread out the rate impact over several years. So it's very, very minimal or almost negligible to our rate payers. This is a multi-generational investment that we're making the land will be appreciating over time on our balance sheet. And also as Mr. Wunderlich pointed out, we have yet to factor in uh, the sources of cash that will come back on a bond investment that are related to sale of property. We know there's interest in the Eastern portions of, of, of N3 Ranch, which are outside the immediate scope of our uh, Del Val and Alameda Creek watersheds. We know that there's interest in conservation easements uh, on the perimeters of the property behind Lake uh, Calaveras Reservoir. Uh, there's expressed interest from other people as well. That all comes in as cash that can support the uh, lower the the obligation of our ratepayers and uh, allow us to finance a bond at a lower price. And once again, I move to the word deadline. We have to set a deadline with these folks. So, because we only will have about an 18 month window from the time we close this transaction to the time that we close a bond offering. So we probably should limit it to one year so that we have time for bond counsel and bond disclosure uh, to do their work uh, uh, properly. And the revenue that can come in off of other opportunities, and I think Director Gunther and I uh, share the same opinion here, that there's opportunity for mitigation land banking on this property, clearly. And Mitigation credits are running out around the Bay Area. Santa Clara is down to zero. Alameda County down to limited uh, mitigation uh, credits. Contra Costa has a lot more. But uh, 
this becomes like an income producing property for the district over the next 40, 50 years. If we set aside just 1,000 acres of land in Alameda County, another 1,000 acres in Santa Clara County, the land is more than paid for itself right there. And then there are, like uh, Mr. Kelly A was pointing out, uh, East Bay Regional Park District and others, you know, uh, have fees, uh, you know, for what you want to do on the grounds, camping, hiking, equestrian activities, things like that. Now let me close with this. Water, di water districts, contrary to what was said earlier in this meeting by one of the uh, public members, do the very best job of managing not only their watersheds, but offering parks and recreation and all kinds of activities. Marin Municipal Water District, which is the first municipal water district in California, formed in 1912, they own all of their watershed up to the top of Mount Tamalpais. Look at all the recreational opportunities they offer and all of the educational opportunities they offer. Nevada Irrigation District, headquartered in Grass Valley in Nevada City, they own 250,000 acres of land, eight different lakes, seven or eight different lakes, all the way to the Nevada-California border. I went on a tour of it. And I saw all of the magnificent things that they're doing as a small water district. Then you have East Bay Regional Park District, which is managing close to 90,000 acres in their watershed and offering all of the same things for their public. And then you have some of the activities of Zone 7. Look at all the activities of uh, Santa Clara Valley Water District, and you can go out more broadly around California. This is where water districts actually serve the public in the best way because park districts run on a thin line in terms of revenue and profitability. Water districts have a consistent stream of revenue. And I dearly wanna open up this land which is now private into the, the broader Bay, uh, Bay Area public for enjoyment and, and future activities like I've described. So thank you very much for the time. I know it took a little bit more than usual here, but, uh, and I thank all the public input, by the way, whether it's positive or, or against. Thank you. Thank you, Director Sethi. Uh, President of Barry, may I? Yes, absolutely. So I am going to try to bring us back to the basics here. Alameda County Water District's mission is to provide clean and reliable water at a reasonable cost to our customers in Fremont, Newark, and Union City. In my opinion, we should not and cannot spend our customers' funds to purchase a piece of property that does not provide additional water supply or significant water quality improvement. In terms of water supply and water quality, as we saw from staff presentation, purchasing the N3 Ranch will not provide the district with additional water supply unless we build a dam, flood a large portion of the property, and destroy valuable habitats. Nor will the purchase of the property provide ACWD with significant water quality improvements. 27% of the N3 Ranch is outside of the Alameda Creek watershed. And there are also significant business risk and liabilities associated with the purchase of this property that have not been fully evaluated. These liabilities could include, for example, the responsibility to clean up abandoned mine sites, which could be very, very expensive. A quick web search that today shows that there are multiple mining districts and potentially many historical mines in this area. ACWD customers should not be asked to shoulder these unknown liabilities and accept up to 5.2% rate increase with no additional water supply and limited water quality improvements. In terms of fairness, I actually agree with the speakers and the email support letters that it is important to protect our limited open space and our watershed. However, ACWD customers should not be asked to carry the entire burden of financing this transaction and the associated risks and liabilities when other local water agencies such as Zone 7, which supplies water to Dublin, San Ramon, Livermore, and Pleasanton, will also benefit. It is unfair to ask our customers in Newark, 
to pay for property that will benefit the residents of San Ramon, whose median household income is 38% higher. In terms of watershed and open space protection, many of the commenters seem to be under the impression that this property will be guaranteed to be preserved as an open space with public access if ACWD purchased this property. Unfortunately, this is not true. ACWD is not a land use agency or an open space agency. ACWD is a water supply agency. If you have been following ACWD's board meetings, you would have known that there's at least one director on this board that would like to build a dam on the N3 Ranch property and flood the valuable habitats. You also know that there is at least one director on this board that believes water supply should always override open space protection and public access. In terms of the comments and emails we received in support for the purchase of this property, I noted that many of the emails are from people living outside the district and are not financially obligated to pay for this project for perpetuity. I especially know that an email from district from director Sarah Palmer from Zone 7 Water Agency supporting ACWD's purchase of this property. Since Zone 7 Water Agency is the nearest public water agency to N3 Ranch and will benefit directly from the purchase of the ranch, I question whether Ms. Palmer will request the Zone 7 Board to financially contribute to the purchase of the ranch and share some of the liabilities associated with the purchase. In terms of financial responsibility, we need to ask ourselves, is it wise for ACWD to spend $68 million on N3? My answer would be no. Instead of buying N3, I believe we should spend it on projects such as the construction of a treatment plant to remove emergent chemicals such as PFAS from our drinking water, from our groundwater. The construction of a treatment system to reduce the water hardness in our Northern service area the rehabilitation of the mothball Mission San Jose treatment plant to increase our water treatment capacity, the construction of a water recycling facility that would increase our local water supply reliability, the participation in the Los Vaqueros expansion project and the construction of the Transfer Bethany pipeline to increase local water storage, or the acceleration of pipeline replacement to minimize water line breaks and prevent a recurrence of what happened at Japan. Jalapa Court a few weeks ago, where waterline breaks resulted in two homes being red tagged. Instead of purchasing the N3 ranch, we should invest the funds on projects that would improve water quality, improve water supply reliability, and minimize rate impacts. Finally, I can support ACWD's purchase of a portion of the N3 ranch that will directly benefit our customers. However, ACWD customers should not be asked to bear the cost for the purchase, maintenance, and the risk and liabilities associated with the purchase of the entire N3 ranch, especially when there are other water supply and water quality improvement projects with significant rate impacts potentially on the horizon. If this backup offer is accepted, ACWD has no assurance that other partners will financially contribute to this purchase. We could be left financially financing the entire property, financially burdening ACWD customers for something that predominantly benefit both your residents in the Tri-Valley area. It is just unfair. Thank you. Thank you, Director Huang. Um, <clears throat> I will, uh, I'll try to keep my, my comments succinct. Um, I, I want to first thank all of the members of the public uh, and the board who who shared their comments today. Um, I know there's uh, this is obviously a very um, unique topic for us to be discussing and, and one that I think uh, has brought out a lot of different opinions for especially from members of the community. Um, and so I, I like Director Sethi stated, you know, we, we've uh, uh, done our best to try and uh, solicit public feedback throughout the course of these discussions, starting uh, all the way back in October of 2019. Um, and some of the nature of the discussions and negotiations that we've had have been in closed session. And I appreciate that there are, of course, concerns from members of the public as to what's been discussed. Uh, but I, I do want to assure everyone that the, the nature of those discussions did require us to be in closed session. Um, you know. 
Uh, I, I've given this topic quite a bit of thought. I think all of the directors have had a long time to think about this. And, um, and as has been pointed out, several of us, and myself included, have uh, have had you know different opinions as the course of the discussions have gone on as well about how to participate in this project. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of my thoughts, uh, you know, I, I had the opportunity to share them in the last uh, election cycle because that was a, a frequent topic of discussion in, in public forums. And like I had mentioned then, and um, and we'll mention again tonight, uh, I do support us working in coalition with with local and regional partners uh, as we have been for the past year and a half or so. Um, uh, <laughs> see. I, I, it, I do believe, I think contrary to uh, you know, Director Huang, I appreciate your comments, but I do believe that um, given the discussions that we have had with the partners and the work that we've done, uh, it, I do think that we would have their support should we put in a backup offer and that they would participate in that um, and, and would financially participate in that for both the initial purchase and for the ongoing O&M costs. I, I don't think there's a, a solid enough case to be made for our customers to take on the full responsibility for this, uh, for this purchase and for the ongoing maintenance. Uh, but that's, that's why we've had such extensive discussions with other partners and um, given where we are right now, and given that we do have the opportunity to take the lead in this negotiation and to, and to put in a backup offer, I would certainly be in support of that. But again, with the understanding that, we, that uh, my support would be to, to, work, to continue to work with, with the partnership for the purchase and for the, uh, the O&M costs. And I will, uh, I'll, I'll leave my comments there for, for tonight. Um, let me ask Mr. Stevenson and the rest of staff if they received enough comments from, uh, from the board to, to have direction as to how we wish to proceed. Thank you, President Alvari, and I appreciate the discussion and, um, and appreciate the input and comments from the public as well. Um, yeah, I believe we have the, the feedback that we need. Um, I think that um, uh, the logical next step is to again convene in closed session later on uh, in the agenda and um, continue discussions about the specifics um, related to price in terms of payment and so forth. So, um, so I think that's uh, our next move, uh, President Akbari. Okay. Given that, I will conclude this special order of business and we will move on to item four in the agenda, the consent calendar. Are there any items that directors would like to add to the consent calendar? There's, to, so there's an item relating to rubber dam number one that I would like to have the opportunity to abstain on. Um, I think that is item 5.5, .5, is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right, then I will make a motion to add items 51, 52, 53, 54, and 56 to the consent calendar, please. I will second uh, Director Wise's uh, motion. And if I'm if I may, just before the board takes a vote, I just wanted to uh, just mention that um, a previous version of the board packet included minutes that had an error in them. Uh, uh, that error has been corrected and the minutes were corrected for the June 10 board meeting to show that Director Gunther did recuse himself from item 5.11 in that meeting. And so the, the version of the board packet and the minutes that are on the website currently are correct. Thank you for that clarification. I believe we have, uh, <clears throat> we have a motion and a second to uh, amend the consent calendar. So, um, directors, we. Aye. Gunther. Aye. Huang. Aye. Steffi. Aye. And Akbari. Aye. Is there a motion to adopt the amended consent calendar? I'll uh, move to adopt the amended consent calendar this evening. I'll second. Directors, we. Aye. Gunther. 
Aye. Huang? Aye. Steffi? Aye. And Akbar? Great. Aye. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I need to speak louder. I apologize. Um, okay, with that, we move on to item 5.5, the authorization of change order for the rubber dam number one, Alameda County drop structure fishway, rubber dam number one control building modifications, and shin pond fish screens construction. And I will turn it to our general manager. Thank you, President Akbari. And I'm pleased uh, to turn this item over to our interim Director of Engineering and Technology Services, and I welcome her to our meeting today, Ms. Reka Ipagunta, who will provide a brief summary. I think. Yes, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. This item involves change order number one, number 10 for rubber dam one, fish passage improvements project. This change order addresses a number of necessary changes related to the project design and construction, including upgrades to the design of fish ladder access hatch, material and uh, control building roofing, modifications to the construction site water management systems, and provision for additional special backfill materials associated with the shin pond diversions and the new fish weight rubber dam one. There is adequate funding in the CIP um, budget and staff's recommendation is to, by motion, approve change order number 10 in the amount of $232,431.89 to Flatiron West um, INC for the Rubber Dam 1 Alameda County Drop Structure Fishway RD1 Control Building Modifications and Shin, um, Shin Pond Fish Screens Construction Project jobs number 21006, 21012, and 21019. Thank you, Mr. Devinta. Are there any members of the board who wish to make a comment or ask a question on this item? Um, just say my abstention is uh, I have abstained. I had initially not voted on rubber dam number one due to uh, conflicts with litigation I was involved with uh, on properties in the immediate vicinity of rubber dams number one and three. And Therefore, the abstention is in conjunction with that. I have additional thoughts and comments which I've not expressed related to rubber dam number one, but this is not the time to do it. Thank you, Director Weed. Um, any other members of the board who wish to make a comment or ask a question on this item? Hearing none, are there any members of the public who wish to make a comment or ask a question on this item? Oh, Director Gunther, I saw you come off of mute there. Uh, do you want to make a comment? No, I was just going to move the staff recommendation whenever. Okay, uh, let me let me open it up for uh, members of, members of the public. Hearing none, uh, Director Gunther, if you want to make a motion, I'll move the staff recommendation. I'll second. Director Sweet. Thank. Gunther. Aye. Wong. Aye. Steffi. Aye. Aye. Great. Moving on to item 5.8, resolution approving fiscal year 2021-2022 consolidated salary schedule and related salary schedules. And I will turn it to our general manager, Mr. Stevenson. Thank you. And for this item, I will turn it over to our manager of human resources, uh, Jennifer Salito. Good evening, board of directors. I'm Jennifer Salito, HR manager. This item is related to the annual adoption of the district's various salary schedules. The board of directors is required to adopt a resolution approving the annual salary schedule, and in this case, fiscal year 21-22, that lists the base pay for all district job classifications. And because our consolidated salary schedule lists also lists the general manager's salary range, a verbal report, report is required to summarize the recommendation. There are three salary schedules for board consideration tonight. The consolidated salary schedule, which includes all district job classifications, the career service pay salary schedule, which applies only to represented positions, and the performance-based pay schedule, which applies to certain unrepresented classifications, 
and is a program that has been discontinued, but due to one legacy employee, the schedule is required to still be annually readopted. The consolidated salary schedule also reflects the implementation of the district's 2021 classification and compensation study for all unrepresented job classifications, as well as the updated general manager salary range. Both of these items were approved by your board on June 10th. The district is currently in negotiations with the two bargaining groups, so there are no proposed changes to the base pay rates shown on the consolidated pay schedule for represented positions at this time. Once an agreement is reached with a bargaining unit that does result in changes to any of the base pay rates, staff will update the applicable rates and salary schedules and return to the board at that time. So the action before your board tonight is by motion to adopt the resolution approving and adopting the attached fiscal year 21-22 consolidated salary schedule and two other related salary schedules. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Salito. Uh, I'll open it up to the board for any questions or comments on this item. Hearing none, uh, I will open it up now to members of the public for any questions or comments. Mr. Ken N. Thank you, President Akbari. This is just really more of a bookkeeping item. It would be useful for the public when they're reviewing this uh, proposed new salary schedule to see the delta from the previous year, either as a percentage or as an amount, um, just so that the public doesn't have to go and dig up the previous salary schedule and do a manual comparison. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Any other members of the public who wish to make a comment or ask a question? If not, I will turn it back to the board. Is there a motion on the table? I'll move staff recommendation. I'll second. Great. Director Tweed? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Wong? Aye. Duffy? Director Sethi? I believe Director Sethi may have stepped away. And Akbari. Aye. Um, given that Director Sethi seems to have stepped away, I think maybe we should uh, take a quick break, I'm thinking. Um, I think a good idea, Director. Uh... Akbari, can we take maybe five? Yeah, why don't, why don't we uh, take a break until, I have 7.43, so why don't we take a break until 7.50? Thank you. Uh, I think we have everyone except for Director Weed, so let's just wait another minute. I'm going to turn off my camera while I'm eating. No problem. Great. It is 7.53 PM, and the board is reconvening. Uh, we are on item 5.9, resolution approving the intention to change from at-large to zone-based elections for election of members of the board of directors. And I will turn it to Mr. Stevenson. Thank you, President Akbari. The Board of Directors are currently elected at large per the district's enabling legislation. Generally, under the California Voting Rights Act, a lar an at-large election is prohibited if racially polarized voting limits the, abil limits the ability of minorities to elect or influence the election of minority candidates. The district received a letter from a law firm alleging that the district's at-large elections violate the California Voting Rights Act. The district does not agree with these allegations. However, in order to ensure that the board most effectively represents all interests of its residents and encourages the fullest voter participation, the board will change to a zone-based election system um, for board members for the November 2022 election, following the required public hearing process to create the zones. And so just quickly mentioning that this is the, the first step in the process. 
Um, and this would be followed by the development of five district zones within the district service area, following the release of the 2020 census data upon which these zones would be based. So there would be a public hearing process to receive public input and to formalize those zones. The new districts would apply to the board's elections beginning with the next election in November 2020 or 2022. So staff's recommendation is by motion, adopt the resolution approving the intention to change from at large to zoned based elections for the elections of members of the board of directors. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, are there any members of the board who wish to make a comment or ask, ask a question on this item? I have some comments, but do we have first any comment from the public? Uh, I was going to take comments from the public after board discussion. Okay, you're, you're sure in your meeting. I had a couple questions for the attorney. Um, first of all, I would hope that we could retain at large elections for as long as possible. I believe that the public is better served when the directors are elected at large from the entirety of the community. Next. Um, there's been an emergency. We, we have delayed this action because of a state of emergency declared by the governor. Has that, and yet I, I noted today that yet another state of emergency was declared by the governor based on water um, availability and uh, supply in the state. Do we have any protection under the, um, any opportunity to continue this item based on the state of emergency declared by the governor, emergencies. So that might be a question for me. Yeah. Um, uh, I know the governor made an announcement today. I think it was related to the drought. I'm not aware that the actual executive order has been uh, distributed, at least I haven't seen it. So I do not know if the governor's executive order from today deals with uh, items related to the California Voting Rights Act. I, I can tell you that the governor did issue an executive order um, as part of the reopening of California process that um, did address a number of executive orders, including the one that deals with the California Voting Rights Act. Um, and that uh, basically uh, the, it, it um, said that the, the executive order that deals with the California, right, California Voting Rights Act um, uh, is expiring. Okay. We have received a threat of a lawsuit and there's a safe harbor where we have to act within a certain period of time without getting involved in expensive litigation. I understand that and uh, will reluctantly uh, support these items. But the other question is, do we have to do it? How long can we delay this? Is the timeline required that we do it this month or might we be able to continue it to the next month's meeting? There's no requirement for the board to act tonight. Um, the resolution that is before the board um, establishes a process and a timeline for proceeding. And the process will start based on the resolution that's before the board tonight after the census data is distributed and then it would start within three months after that. Um, and then there's a public hearing process that's required by statute. Um, so your resolution addresses the timing for that and the end result of the timing needs it, means it needs to be completed so that the district, ACWD district board would be um, uh, elected by zone-based elections for the November 2022 election. That's what's in your resolution. If it were delayed or the census data were delayed, would that, might there be, uh, we don't know when that might be uh, given all the lawsuits and counter lawsuits. Might there be an opportunity to delay this beyond the, uh, the 2022 election to the 2024 election just on circumstances, and are we assure, uh, you know, are we closing the door on the option of having a, uh, being able to kick this can down the road even further? 
So your resolution right now, as currently drafted, provides that you will start the process three months after the distribution of the census data. So that's the trigger. So if that gets delayed, then your process will get delayed. And you mentioned 2022 as a requirement. Is need it be a requirement that we deal one way or because if we do 2022 and we don't have the census data available, we'll have to rely on the old census data or the 2020, um, or excuse me, the 2010 census data, and then have to redo it again uh, within weeks or months. So um, I'm just hoping that we're not boxing ourselves in. So again, if you adopt the resolution that's before you, your process will not start until three months after the census data becomes available. So if that gets delayed, your process gets delayed. Um, so that's the trigger. Should we not leave then blank the, the date of the election that we're going to be uh, uh, implementing this? Because it will fall on the election following the, the uh, completion of the process. And if that goes beyond a specific date, we might have it kicked out to 2024. So I will leave that to the board to talk about whether the board wants to modify the resolution as currently drafted. Okay, and that my suggestion will be to merely delete the 2022 and just say, it will be to the next appropriate election. <clears throat> Director okay. Stuthy here. Uh, I'm in favor of continuing this to next month or the month after. I think there are really two critical bars that hurdles that we need to get over as triggers. So two triggers. One is the census data comes out and the other is that the governor rescinds his executive order. So both would have to be qual uh, qualified in order for us to move forward. Because he may not lift the executive order until sometime after the uh, census results are out. Uh, Director Sethi, I believe the, uh, we were advised that the governor has lifted the executive order. But then the other question is, what is our timing to uh, that we have to meet now? Oh, is that true, Mr. Miyake? That's correct. He lifted the uh, executive order? The one that pertains to the suspension of the safe harbor requirements in the California Voting Rights Act has been lifted. As of when? Uh, I believe it's July 1st. Oh, so just recently. All right. I stand corrected. President Bari, if I may. Director Vaughn. I have a question for council, uh, Mr. Miyagi. So I assume we are currently still within the safe harbor period, correct? So what is the implication of waiting another month? I know the trigger won't happen until we three months after the census result, but is there any risk or liabilities for us to kick this issue down the road for another month? No. Okay. So, so I, I will say since the trigger for the district. Okay, but I, I guess what I'm going to say is the trigger is going to be the same, which is three months after the census, the new census results come in. So I don't feel strongly either way. However, one have to question why do we want to delay another month if the exact same thing is going to come back? Are we going to gain any new information? in this month, is there, what is the advantage of waiting another month? Uh, Mr. Miyagi, can you provide any input? Um, from my legal perspective, there's no advantage to waiting another month, but okay. if the board chooses right. to wait another month, that's certainly a policy direct, direction that the board can okay. uh, take for sure. So it's a purely policy direction. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, so the next question for council is this. So we know the trigger is three months after the new census results. I do share Director Wee's concern that if we put in the, the next election day, um, we 
will we be boxed in if there's a major delay in releasing the new census result? Will we be forced to go to the zone-based election immediately without having the opportunity to actually use the new census data? So based on the questions that I'm getting, Right. I do recommend that you defer this a month. Okay. And um, and then uh, we can provide some, we can look into this and provide some answers to the questions that we're getting from the directors. Okay. Because of course, if there's not... any other questions, certainly fire them away because we'll answer them okay. all uh, in this month period. Right. Because if not, I was going to say I'm with director we that we could modify it to say the next appropriate election or something of that sort, just so that we can commit to use the new census data, but we could have this discussion next month if it's appropriate. And it would also give the um, council opportunity to look at the current executive orders and executive orders that may come out because hopefully there's some other people in the state that were felt comfort more comfortable with the pre July 1st and the post July 1st requirements. So thank you. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, sorry. Go ahead, Director Wong. Thank you, Director Seppi. I am just going to say that, you know, I am a strong believer that the, however we draw the new zones, it should be based on the latest census result because it really should reflect our population, our current population, not something from many, many, many years ago. So thank you. Mr. Miyake, do we know uh, approximately what month uh, our demographers are going to come back with proposed sets of maps on zones? Yeah, and again, this is based on what's in your current resolution that's in your agenda packet. The, the process is not going to start until three months after the release of the census data. And then they will start have a public hearing. We've already engaged a demographer um, who will walk us through the process for helping us develop these five different zones based on the requirements that are set forth in the California Voting Rights Act, which are also set forth in your resolution, which we can review again. Mm -hmm. There's one other reason I'm in favor of continuing this out on a month by month basis, because you see where the Delta variant of COVID-19 is taking off in, in various pockets of the country. Most of the deaths right now are from the Delta variant. Um, and we know that flu season will be coming back just around the time that the South census data is being released. And you never know whether the governor is going to have to put in uh, the re reemergence of uh, restrictions, you know, if the Delta flu or whatever virus is, is taking off like crazy, we might go into another lockdown period. And I'm kind of reminded of the Spanish flu that it really took five years to get through the entire thing, that it was an up and down um, course, uh, you know, not only by hemisphere of the world, but um, continents and everything. So I'm really in favor of uh, continuing it and uh, studying it on a, on a month by month basis. Okay. And I support the continuous. Let me ask you, when you do do the next revision or review, that you determine if there is a challenge to the census data, even though it's been released, can we wait until that challenge has been adjudicated or are we boxing ourselves in and having to go with the data that's on the table? We'll look into that. Thank you for the question. So I just want to be clear. I am not a proponent of kicking this can down the road for month by month. What I would like is to give us a little bit time to explore this a little bit further, just so that we will not be forced to draw zones using old census data. At some point, we do need to adopt this resolution. I rather have it sooner than later. But I do agree there are outstanding questions that we need to have answered. Thank you. So given, <clears throat> given the discussion, it sounds like there is board consensus around pushing this item to next month's agenda. Is that correct? 
Can I just get the? Yes, I would. I would concur with that. I don't support the concept, but uh, um, that's for another time. I think we have to go this direction, but I also really have some difficulty too. Is with all the director's comments, I agree with all of them, particularly the data is not out yet, the three months after the data. So I think one more month to, to look at these questions that were asked, what happens if it's challenged, et cetera. Um, taking out the, the actual uh, uh, date of the election, I believe is probably a good idea. And um, that's the only comments I have. I have certainly would feel pushing it one month, I think it's fine. I would, I would agree with that as well. Um, I, I do want to give an opportunity for any questions or comments from members of the public. Mr. Kennan. Yes, um, I, I, I agree with all the comments that have been made by the directors. Um, I think uh, the general manager in his introduction uh, did explain the, the origin of this action. Uh, I'm just assuming uh, from reading through the, the news that it's uh, Mr. Shankman. And I guess my only admonition to the board is uh, he has a, you know, looking through the court records, he's got an amazing record <laughs> of, of winning uh, and that jurisdictions that have attempted to stall or, or somehow sweep this under the rug have basically paid uh, dearly and, you know, it, you know, as a rate payer, I would be very disappointed if the district were uh, subject to a, a judgment um, in, in a case. Uh, it just, you know, the, the probability of winning <laughs> seems to be about zero based on what I'm reading. Uh, this guy, again, has a remarkable record. Uh, and, and I just caution the district not to get on the wrong side of what seems to be an ever increasing pile of case law uh, that um, seems to favor uh, this attorney over, over uh, the various agencies in California. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Mr. Kelly A. Um, thank you very much. Um, this, this issue of redistricting is um, actually uh, got a lot longer history and uh, a lot more um, ramifications um, than, uh, than, than most people realize. Uh, most people think we're just playing around with these lines a little bit and every, these, every 10 years, they gotta make these changes with the new census data. Really the census data is, uh, is just frosting on the cake. Um, what's really happening with this redistricting you even saw it in Fremont on a microscopic scale in the city of Fremont. If you look at the boundary line between districts two and districts three, we heard this long song and dance, this uh, uh, fairy tale about, uh, you know, the, uh, representing the Afghan community or whatever, when in fact that was gerrymandered, that little squiggly line between districts two and three was gerrymandered for very special political reasons, which I won't get into here. When you look at the Alameda County Board of Supervisors, you have a district that combines uh, East Oakland and South Pleasanton and extends and gerrymandered. Uh, it's really uh, a, a fi uh, the, one of the finest examples of, uh, of, of gerrymandering, which is not fair and not inclusive. It destroys the communities of interest and has uh, split up. It's actually partitioned certain uh, census designated places like, uh, you know, Ashland, Cherryland, uh, Sinol, um, ver various things for very political reasons. Um, and what they did, and uh, that's what I'd like to caution you against, what, the, what these uh, uh, boards of, and uh, political bodies that are the most least, uh, in, with the least integrity uh, in, uh, around, um, what they do is they will bring in demographers or independent consultants or whoever and pay them and then go in a closet and make these decisions themselves. And you end up with results like what we see in uh, East Oakland and Pleasanton. Um, they've even... Uh, the East Bay Regional Park District has even uh, divided up the Tri-Valley. San Ramon gets, uh, is not part of the Tri-Valley in the East Bay Regional Park District. They've combined Fremont and Livermore. 
uh, in the East Bay Regional Park District. So did the uh, the the Board of Supervisors <laughs> Alameda County. This is outrageous, and that is why we created something called the Alameda County Coalition for Fair Redistricting. Uh, take a look at our website. We have a lot of community groups all over Alameda County, um, and we support independent commissions to do redistricting. <laughs> Um, it, it, the more independence, the more uh, uh, fairness, the more inclusivity, the, the separating that drawing from the, uh, the political board is the only way to assure uh, some, some, uh, some uh, you know, uh, trust in the system. Otherwise, you'll end up with with what we with what the East Bay Regional Park District does, and most spectacularly, what the Board of Supervisors of Alameda County has done. And by the way, I'd also like, while we're here, and there's a lot of people here listening today, I would like to call out Zone Seven Water Agency and ask them, uh, what are they doing with districts district uh, elections for their Board of Supervisors or Board of Directors? Uh, I think their their Board of Directors is far more in need of some serious reform than this board that I'm talking to today, which is, you know, uh, obviously doing, uh, 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 doing their best to, uh, to carry out their duties. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Are there any other members of the public who wish to make a comment on this item? Hearing none, uh, I think we've given, um, staff enough direction on this item to come back a month later, but let me check again with the general manager and with district council to make sure that they have what they need. Yeah, pending any further comments by um, general counsel, I think we have um, good direction. We'll address these issues between now and August and we'll bring the item back in August. Sounds good. I agree. Okay. Thank you very much. We will now move on to item five. Point 10, authorization to extend cer certain COVID-19 related temporary employee benefits through September 30th, 2020. And I'll turn it back to the general manager. And again, I will um, pass this along to our HR manager, uh, Ms. Jennifer Salito. Good evening again, board of directors. Item 510 is a request to extend certain temporary employee benefits related to COVID-19 through September 30th, 2021. The item is very similar to an item that came before your board in September of 2020, which requested a similar extension of the same benefits through June 30, 2021. Due to the ongoing nature of the pandemic and the district's interest in ensuring staff have the resources to take any needed leave if impacted by the pandemic, staff is again requesting an extension of the majority of these benefits. Specifically, this item requests the board grant the general manager approval to extend the usage period for the 80 hours of sick leave that was granted in March of 2020 under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. The action also requests to extend certain non-economic work flexibilities while the pandemic continues. All items are requested to be extended to September 30th, 2021 to match the expiration of the Supplemental Paid Sick Leave Program which was mandated by the state of California in March of 2021 and also expires on September 30th. This action would not provide any new or additional benefits or leave time or economic impact, but would extend the time, the time frame for staff to use the accruals. And I'm happy to answer any questions or provide further details. Are there any questions or comments from members of the board? Hearing none, uh, are there any questions or comments from members of the public? And again, hearing none, is there a motion on the table? I'll move staff recommendation. I'll second. Correct to speak? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Fong? Aye. Steffi? Aye. And Akbari? Aye. Moving on to item six, uh, 6.1, board committee reports. Are there any questions or comments from members of the board or members of the public on any of our board committee reports? None from me. 
Um, Great. Hearing none, we'll move on to item 6.2, operational report. Are there any questions or comments from members of the board or members of the public on any of our operational reports? Just a comment on the harness report. Uh, nice job. We'll keep moving. Thank you, sir. Great. Hearing no further comments, we will move to item 6.3.1, drought and water conservation update, and I will turn it to uh, our general manager, Mr. Stevenson. Thank you, President Akbari. Obviously a timely topic, so we're happy to present uh, um, what's happening within the district uh, with regard to the drought and water conservation. And, um, and as has already been discussed this evening, the, the governor has made some announcements today. We'll address um, those um, also in our talk, but I'll turn it over now to our manager of water resources, Laura Haidas. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. And I'm gonna go ahead and attempt to share my screen here. And let's see if I can get that going. Okay, so hopefully you should see the slides now. Um, tonight's presentation follows on the updates we've been providing at the Water Resources and Conservation Committee as drought conditions have evolved this year. And staff is happy to be here to brief the full board on the very latest information at the committee's timely request. Just today, as you may have heard and heard earlier tonight, Governor Newsom held a press conference and this afternoon and announced a call for 15% voluntary water conservation by all Californians, as well as a related uh, executive order and drought emergency proclamation that adds nine counties to the list under a drought emergency, which now totals 50 of 58 counties in the state. Given this announcement and worsening conditions, as well as concerns toward next year, an additional ramp up of outreach and conservation efforts is warranted, as well as consideration of how we might address the governor's call for conservation in our own messaging and outreach. Tonight, staff will be providing an overview on current supply conditions, on water conservation and outreach efforts to date, and what's to come. The team is also working on additional creative ideas and efforts to raise local awareness and encourage conservation, and we are interested in the board's questions and feedback on what we are sharing tonight and on our path forward. Before we kick off the presentation, I'd also like to acknowledge the hard work of the cross departmental team that is working on drought related efforts and thank them for their dedication and adaptability as conditions continue to evolve. So we have a couple of different speakers tonight, but at, now I'd like to first turn it over to Mr. Leonard Ash, Water Supply Supervisor, to begin the presentation. Thank you, Ms. Haidas. Yes, given the governor's announcements today, I'm pleased to start this presentation. Uh, where multiple staff will be providing the latest drought and water conservation updates to keep the board informed as the drought continues. And next slide, please. All right, thank you. The Water Resources and Conservation Committee has been tracking the progression of the drought classification as shown by the U.S. Drought Monitor. Uh, in our service area and greater Alameda Creek watershed as it's increased from moderate to severe to extreme drought intensities as the year has progressed. Now this slide demonstrates the evolution in the last two months uh, where the US drought monitor classification of drought intensities has continued to evolve. As you can see, as you move from the map on the left to the right, uh, from older to more recent, the maps show in dark red color, the exceptional intensity has spread first from a large band through the North Bay and East Bay in mid-May, expanding at eastward and up into the Sacramento River watershed, with much of the Delta and to the north into much of Shasta and Butte counties uh, are now classified in the exceptional drought intensity. And likewise, in the southern part of the state, uh, we're seeing that westward creep, that intensity spreading in June to cover much of Kern County and also reaching north into Mariposa and Tuolumne counties. While this, is, uh, this map is just one metric for tracking drought severity, uh, and we do know that local conditions do vary, uh, it is a useful tool for us to gauge how the various sources of our imported water supplies and our local conditions are affected uh, with the dry conditions. And I do want to note that the US Drought Monitor did release their latest updated map today, and there are only very slight changes 
to the version on the right from one month ago. Next slide, please. And now I would like to present some of the high level updates since our last presentation to the board. Regionally for the Western part of the US, including California, NOAA forecasts show increased probabilities for above normal temperatures for the one week, the two week, the one month and three month outlooks. While conventional models are less accurate farther into the future, some experimental modeling does suggest that we could expect increased probabilities for above normal temperatures continuing into 2022 and the next summer, potentially early indications of a third dry year. District staff is monitoring the actions that the Department of Water Resources, or DWR, is taking in the Delta. Uh, first, DWR has received a temporary authorization on June 1st from the State Water Board to proceed with modified operations in accordance with the temporary urgency change petition that DWR filed on May 17th, which would modify environmental objectives that the state water project would have to meet, such as outflow requirements and water quality parameters. The comment period closed after the temporary authorization from the state board, and there were comments submitted by various non-governmental organizations and others contesting the action and staff will continue to monitor that. Additionally, late last month, DWR completed the installation of an emergency drought salinity barrier constructed out of rock at the West Falls River, which will help, bear, uh, the barrier will help to keep salinity out of the central delta. And as for our state water project imports, DWR has consistently stated that they are projected to maintain our 2021 deliveries as we have requested them even in the summer and fall months. DWR's Delta Field Division is working closely with the district and with other South Bay contractors to keep Lake Del Val topped off, even in between planned maintenance and operational projects. Not only is that a benefit for recreation at Lake Del Val, uh, but for the South Bay contractors like us, keeping the reservoir as full as possible for as long as possible provides an additional hedge of security to have additional water available for blending if Delta water quality conditions decline or if there are state water project impacts due to an unforeseen catastrophic event. Lastly, I want to note it's imperative in a critical dry year like this, the district staff continue to closely coordinate with DWR, Semi-Tropic, San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, as well as our South Bay Aqueduct partners and other state contractors. And now Ms. Renee Gonzalez, our public affairs super, sorry, specialist, uh, will provide an update on the water conservation campaign. Thank you, Leonard. Hi everyone. Um, since the start of our water conservation campaign in May, we have been promoting the campaign to customers utilizing a multitude of mediums and outlets to communicate our One Saves Water message. Our outreach to date includes the following. On our website, you'll find our homepage with the One Saves Water campaign posted to acwd.org with a direct link to their Drought Resource Center. We also announced the campaign launch as a news item on the website's homepage linking to the Drought Resource page. The Drought Resource page is designed to be a repository of drought information and resources. This features information about the effects of the drought statewide and locally. A fact sheet details how ACWD plans to meet water demands and a tip sheet provides quick tips to, to save water indoors and outdoors. You'll also find answers to frequently asked questions. And customers can find links to ACWD's water conservation resources, rebates, and programs, as well as other websites with more ways to save water. Um, from May 18th to now, um, this drought resource page has received over 5,500 page visits, with over 40% of those visits um, then clicking onto our rebate info. Um, we've also been promoting this campaign on social media. We've done 30 posts in June across three platforms with 12 of those posts in, um, it's actually three different languages with all posts, including hashtag one saves water. Those different lang the languages were Chinese, Arabic, and Hindi. 
So these same tips will be shared on our social media channels in Farsi, Spanish, and Tagalog. The campaign ads are airing on Union City's cable access channel. We actually made a video of our One Save Water tips, and that's airing on UCTV 15, the City of Union City's government cable access channel. And for print media, we've run ads in the Tri-City Voice. This newspaper is available online in addition to physical copies at local distribution sites. Our outreach to various populations throughout the service, service area include the senior center staff in Fremont, Newark, and Union City, as well as the Fremont Family Resource Center. Next slide, please. We have reached out to those on our stakeholder list um, via email, which includes 220 nonprofits, community organizations, and city officials. We sent an email to 6,000 of our engaged customers and publicized the campaign in multiple posts on Nextdoor with over receiving over 5,500 impressions. And we also issued a news release um, with earned media in the Tri-City Voice and Aqua News. In addition, the city of Fremont promoted our campaign in an article in their green newsletter. And before the school year ended, we were able to promote this to an audience of 136 students, parents, and teachers through a special online event. This campaign is also featured in this month's bill message, in addition to our upcoming Aqueduct newsletter and a July bill insert later this month. So our planned outreach includes efforts that are scalable to align with district goals. And we are currently exploring creative ways to expand our outreach while being mindful of adhering to COVID-19 protocols to ensure the safety of our employees and customers. Uh, we've had meetings and discussions about coordinated regional messages with other Bay Area water agencies. We are um, currently coordinating with Supervisor David Halbert's office to co-host a drought town hall meeting along with other water agencies in Super, Supervisor Halbert's district. And those include, that includes um, DSRSD, Zone 7, Cal Water, and the City of Livermore. And they've all signed on to participate. And the date for this um, event will be the second or third week of August. And we are also developing yard signs for residential and business customers to display and developing outreach materials for our HOAs, multifamily residential units and our business customers. And we're looking forward to continuing to employ all of our resources and efforts to effectively reach out to customers to save water now. And with that, I will hand it off to Megan. Thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. Next, I will walk you walk the board through our water use efficiency activity. So first, as you may recall, effective uh, June 11th, our, uh, the date of our last board meeting, day after the last board meeting, the district increased the water efficient landscape rebate uh, amount from $1 per square foot to $2 per square foot and increased the maximum rebate amount for single family residential customers to $3,000. And um, an example of what that can look like is in the photo there on the slide. So since that um, increase, we've received 15 new applications and staff has worked with the public affairs team to advertise this increase via email blasts, bill messages, um, and as mentioned, uh, yard signs and Tri-City voice ads. And just as a reminder, the savings from these water efficient landscape rebates and several other water use efficiency measures are considered long-term savings. And so um, the plants take time to establish and uh, the, the water savings will really be achieved later. Next, I'd like to highlight the increase in customer interest um, via the programs we offer and customer information we provide. So as you can see on the slide, um, the water use efficiency programs have increased seven times the number of well rebate applications. And this is um, compared when you average January, February, and March of 2021 to the most recent activity in June of 2021. Uh, continuing on um, three times the water conservation kits, 3.5 times the number of ratio controller redemptions, seven times the number of water waste reports, four times the number of customer calls. And we find that about 80% of the increase in customer calls are related to the well rebate. So 
Due to the increase in activity, staff is in the process of hiring uh, temporary help so we can maintain the nice level of service for our customers. And finally, um, what's upcoming is more targeted outreach. So tips and measures available for specific customer types and targeted outreach to our dedicated landscape customers. And uh, the expansion of our water use efficiency program. So expanding the services in our low income program, providing virtual audits, and we do intend to develop a leak study with the AMI data from the proof of concept to analyze um, and inform the full deployment in our leak alert measure. And of course, we've been continually monitoring the availability of state funding that's become available. And to assist with these upcoming ongoing efforts, we um, will be relying on the temporary assistance that'll be coming shortly. May I make a comment, please, Director Sethi here? Sure. Great job, team, first of all. <laughs> Second, um, you've become too successful now. <laughs> and uh, I hope you can keep up with the demand. Just what a great job. Thank you so much, Director Sethi. <laughs> That's a great segue into um, what the water supply supervisor, Leonard Ash, will be talking about next. If you want to take it from here, Leonard. Thank you. I wanted to uh, close with uh, this slide here that shows that um, staff is continuing to monitor customer demands. This graph uh, shows the 2013 demands in the blue line. Basically, that was the high point of demands immediately before our previous drought. The tan line along the bottom displays the 2015 demands, which shows the customer response to both the early water shortage declaration by ACWD and the subsequent statewide call for mandatory conservation during the last drought. The orange line with circles represents the 2020 demands and the red line with diamonds shows the current 2021 year to date demands. Now, as you may recall, earlier this year, local rainfall essentially stopped after we received uh, 0.16 inches of local rainfall in April, and we observed demands trending higher during a very dry April and again during a completely dry May. We now have our June 2021 demand data on this graph, and clearly customer demands have increased every month so far this year, and customers have used more water in June than they did in May. We also see that the June 2021 demands were lower than the June 2020 demands. Now looking into this uh, more deeply, staff noted that June 2021 had lower evapotranspiration rates than June 2020. Uh, to put it simply, we had cooler weather this June than we had last June. In addition to differences in the weather, there are several other variables affecting demands such as the relaxation of COVID-19 restrictions, uh, the return to the workplace for many of our customers, uh, plus continued public attention to the drought, such as through regional media and our local messaging campaign. Now, in general, the normal expected changes in customer behavior due to cooler weather and the relaxation of COVID-19 restrictions would provide a lower, uh, an expected lower June 2021 demand. Uh, when compared to 2020. Given the other variables I just mentioned, water supply and planning staff are developing a new analytic tool to further evaluate production demand data, and we'll be refining this analysis over the next few weeks. Nonetheless, with these many variables, it is difficult to tell exactly the effect of public conservation messaging campaign is having on customer demands. Nonetheless, the overall message that we had informed the Water Resources and Conservation Committee last month remains the same. There is no clear indication in the demand data that there is a reduction in customer water use through near-term conservation actions. In other words, if customers are responding to the drought messaging, collectively it is not very much and certainly not enough to register as a reduction in overall demands. Next slide, please. So in summary, we wanted to reiterate these high points of the update tonight. Uh, firstly, the water conservation campaign outreach is ongoing. Staff has identified next steps as there are some components of the campaign that are still rolling out. 
and staff is evaluating other creative strategies to enhance the campaign. Secondly, conservation program activity reflects interest in water use efficiency. Um, staff continues to see growing customer interest in water conservation through increased call volumes and increased participation in water use efficiency measures. While some of these measures will take time to realize water savings after customer implementation, this is a positive indication of the potential for long-term savings through water use efficiency. Thirdly, while public messaging locally is still rolling out to fully activate all facets of the campaign, it is too early to tell the impact on demand until we reach a wider saturation of outreach to uh, more customers. And lastly, staff will continue to monitor and provide updates. Conditions remain dry, and unfortunately, early indications are that conditions are not likely to get better anytime soon. So staff remains deeply engaged in planning activities, not just for 2021, but also with an eye on how to best position the district for 2022, if we do indeed experience a third dry year. And with that update, staff will be happy to answer any questions and receive input from the board about these important issues. Thank you very much. Let me open it up to the board for any questions or comments on this update. Um, if I can make a quick comment, um, I just want to thank the staff. Uh, one of the things I don't know, we, we haven't been calling extreme measures, but you know, the public, we paid for that. You paid for it not only in facilities, in water supply diversity, but I also want to point out you paid for the staff that we have is incredibly talented. They're some of the best in the field and they should be recognized. And I hope the public recognizes the fact that we are where we are today because of the staff we have and what they've done. And I just wanted to call, call out the staff and say, thank you. You're doing a great job. Please keep it up. Um, this can be agonizing, but definitely we have some of the best and you should be recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gunther. Uh, John Weed, I would ask that we look at the less uh, that we compare this to some of the lessons learned in the 2015 uh, drought. Lasted several years. That one year graph show the regional media campaign, both in the 2015 and then currently following it, and what the impact was on the regional conservation. Bosca provides a graph for showing what the Bosca membership in the Bay Area has done, and those might be similar comparisons so we can see how we benchmark against the, uh, the overall Bay Area use, water users, which would be impacted by the regional conservation efforts. Next, we were part of a study that showed that tiered rates had little impact on conservation that uh, those type of uh, measures did not influence the users of the last drought, I suspect would not in those districts in this drought as well. And that study would be what we're looking at. Um, I would ask also that we look at the revenues and the impacts of revenues of the district. In the last drought, we had a $60 million shortfall over a period of three years that so we had to go some extraordinary measures to make up, including a drought surcharge. Um, so that we at least keep in mind what that is. Third, next, our operations. We currently maintain the ability to produce, as I understand, about 90 MGD. We peaked at a little over 50. So we have a capacity well above our demand. And if we're dropping it now down into the 30s, we may want to take a look at our operations to see if there are facilities and, um, that we don't need or that we can take offline for an extended period of time. We've taken Mission San Jose offline. Um, one time I suggested maybe we operate Mission San Jose and shut down Water Deep Plant number two and still stay well within the capacity levels of the uh, district. 
but again, it looks at whatever the cost of the production is and how much it's going and what the needs are. We have the ability to use less than potable water in some of our facilities and irrigation. And I would again ask that you look at that as a um, base water supply. And then finally, an editorial comment, we talk about the water possible capacity at uh, Del Val. That's the level allowed. We're only getting 15,000 acre feet of usable storage at Del Val when we could get 67,000 acre feet because of the insidious location of some East Bay Regional Park District facilities. So there's an extraordinary opportunity to address our water shortage and make us immune from the drought influences by simply relocating some park facilities. So thank you. And still maintaining 50% recreation. Thank you, Director Weed. Any other questions or comments from members of the board? I just want to compliment the staff. I actually really enjoyed the social media outreach and I have consistently gone through and liked them. <laughs> Great job. I think they're really effective. They definitely attract the eyeballs for lack of better words. So thank you. Keep up the good work. And I'll reiterate uh, that comment as well. I, I've been getting a lot of questions, especially around the uh, water efficient landscape rebate and the fact that we've raised that uh, to $2 uh, per square foot. And so I'm, I'm happy that the message is getting out there and that members of our community are uh, excited about taking advantage of that. Let me uh, open it up to members of the public. Are there any members of the public who wish to make a comment or ask a question? And I see Mr. Abreu has his hands up. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that it is correct to say that there is no water shortage in ACWD and uh, uh, that, but nonetheless, there is severe political need to show some appropriate level of conservation. And, uh, but before getting into that, let's talk about the, 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 the forecast. These agencies like the State Department of Water Resources just earlier this spring, this year, was forecasting, uh, I don't know, 7 million acre feet of runoff that would come down from our wonderful Sierra Nevada mountain snow melt into our rivers. And 10% of that, hundreds of 700,000 acre feet disappeared, evaporated, uh, vanished and didn't show up because of their faulty forecasting, which is a scientific and technical failure, which any, any agency, I'm not gonna say that they're incompetent, they're, any agency is vulnerable to that. The Valley Water uh, Agency of Santa Clara County six months ago was telling the world that they had everything under control. They're gonna shut down the Anderson Dam. Everything was under control. They had it all figured out. They had many, many plans. And now as of last week, uh, they're telling everybody that th this could be a very serious emergency and coming a uh, dire emergency could be coming up next year. It's a huge flip flop. Uh, and that's happened elsewhere too. these kind of uh, they, these water agencies turn around in a dime and suddenly discover that there's a giant water shortage facing them. Uh, if, if there's excess capacity at ACWD to process water, uh, why don't you just sell it to uh, Valley Water? How about Go find and, and make sure that they pay a, a, a pay enough to where we don't lose, uh, that we uh, can cover our costs and maybe make a little extra. Um, how about that canal? You remember the Vallecitos Canal that you're that uh, runs through Sinol? The Vallecitos Canal runs right by San Antonio Reservoir. Did you know that that's a dirt canal? Last I looked, and that uh, if you put concrete lining on canals, that can cut the water losses by two thirds. So has anybody ever thought of? Lining that with concrete, um, I, I just, I, I don't know, maybe it, uh, I've never looked at the technical, but the uh, economics of that, but uh, just a thought. And then uh, when it comes to all these things, we just heard of all these slides, all of this ignores the most powerful tool uh, in, in, the, in the arsenal of economics, which is called price-based demand management, which is far more effective than PR, far more effective than rebates, and far more effective, the, you know, that the uh, the demand elast elasticity uh, elasticity of demand for a commodity like like water is negative, or or it, you know it's not 
it's it's not uh, it, it it is a positive number. It, it that there is elasticity of demand. Um, all you have to do is raise the price enough, and you will get uh, a reduction in in demand. And as Director Weed is right, we are you are we are operating in an in information vacuum. There is no benchmark data comparing this agency to other water agencies in the Bay Area. Bosca uh, reported last I heard a 13% reduction in demand as compared to baseline of 2019, which would mean if you look back to that chart that this agency is not do, uh, keeping up with the Joneses. And this agency has to keep up with the Joneses, not because you, we're gonna run out of water, but, but because uh, we must uh, maintain our self-respect and uh, keep up with the Joneses and maintain political appearances. If we do not do our share to conserve, to maintain the political appearances, to maintain self-respect, uh, it will turn out very badly for our for uh, this area. We will look real bad if we are out here, you know, filling our swimming pools and uh, and doing all the you know and, and not conserving enough. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. President Akbari, if, if it's okay, I could just uh, provide a couple of um, thoughts. And I think um, Mr. Abreu is certainly right in that uh, the district is okay this year with regard to overall supplies, but not necessarily additional years, right? Um, if the continued very dry conditions persist, um, then we'll have to take further action. So there's really not an incentive for us to um, to uh, not press on conservation and there's certainly not an incentive for us to um, transfer water supplies and so forth uh, to others at this point. Um, and I just also wanted to mention that um, Ms. Heides and I uh, met with uh, Carla Namath and Ted Craddock and others and other GMs um, across the state water project uh, recently in the state and as is evidenced by the governor's proclamations and executive order. Um, the state is really pushing for this 15% voluntary conservation. And we're in the process of trying to um, work through how we're gonna integrate that um, message into our own uh, agency's messaging. Um, and so I, I believe Ms. Heides has some thoughts along those lines and I'll invite her to, um, to share. Thanks, Mr. Stevenson. And this, since this is all pretty new, late breaking news, you know, we're just starting to digest what's in the orders and think about how we might, um, you know, address what uh, the, the governor has been calling for. So that is something, you know, they ha he has asked for a 15% conservation by, by all Californians to date. We have not um, put out in our messaging a specific percentage. We've focused really more on specific actions and actionable items that people can relate to. And I think we will continue doing that, but we, you know, we do also have the option of incorporating a number, a, you know, percentage, a goal of some kind that we might wish to achieve um, within our messaging and or passing on the state's um, you know, request for a 15% conservation in our own messaging. So if the board has any uh, feedback on sort of the, that range of options, uh, we'd be happy to take that back as we're um, thinking through our plans the next few weeks on continuing to roll this out. And, and if there isn't feedback, we're, we'll happy, be happy to bring you some things to consider in the future as well. Uh, let me suggest uh, one, the message uh, for this is important. On our water supply issues, one of the problems we had going in 2015 is we had drained our groundwater reservoir for work on the fish ladders. And fortunately this time, hopefully we have not done that. And we're trying to maximize the water uh, levels of the groundwater reservoir and uh, Niles Cone. Uh, second, we are going into the AMI and it's not going to be really in place for a while to trigger conservation. But I would encourage us to look at master metered facilities because most of the new development in our area is going to be apartments and um, master metered um, facilities. And that we develop a requirement that developers put in sub metering 
which can be monitored by both the property manager as well as by the individual tenant for water conservation. That'd be far more effective than efforts on single family residents. So, thank you. So, Ms. Haidas, I actually really like the action based conservation message. I am just wondering is there any way to combine this, such as to say 15% of water, you just need to do action A, actions A, B, C, and D? Something that people could more directly relate to. I think will be much more helpful. I do have one caution. There are households like mine where the conservation, we, we kept the habit that we developed during the last drought. So 15% might be a hard reach. Yes, and I'm sure we could come up with some creative ways um, to that customers can relate to. Yeah, that, that's a good suggestion. And, and I think you're right, 15% and really the state's baseline for that 15% is last year, 2020. And so really that would equate, given that we're already operating, you know, nearly that much from 2013, it would essentially result in, you know, if, if our customers did achieve that level of conservation or demand reduction, we'd be operating at, you know, roughly 30% below where we were at 20. Uh, 13. Thank you. One, that triggered one quick thought. I was at a session where people were wondering what year were they going to uh, trigger the, uh, the baseline. I understand San Francisco and Santa Clara talked about 2019. So if we're now going to be 2020, hopefully that we can get that standardized within the state so that we're all working out the same baseline. Yeah, I believe that was the, the intent of the state to try and um, help with the messaging by coming up with a standardized baseline. Um, I have a question for Mr. Stevenson. I think you were the engineer at the time. Um, the, we lowered the groundwater basin. Um, what project was that for again? Um, wasn't that a pipeline project? Well, fish, fish ladders and a pipeline. Yeah, we lowered the, the basin conveniently right before the last historic drought um, um, in order to work on rubber dam number one foundation and the dam replacement at that time. If you recall, we had a significant vandalization, you know, vandalization and damage event, and we had a lot of work to do in a very short period of time. Um, there was also other work going on with regard to fish passage facilities at that time. So, um, so yeah, that, that's what the, we lowered the basin for. Okay. Great. Uh, any <clears throat> questions or comments from the board or from members of the public? If not, we will conclude item 6.3.1. And we will move on to item uh, 6.4.1, update on the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, thank you, President Akbari. This will be a very brief report. We've been trying to make sure that the board is um, kept up to speed in terms of what's happening at the district with regard to uh, dealing with this um, issue and, and and as we try and continue to meet our objectives of keeping our employees safe while getting the important work done, supporting our employees and their families. And on that note, I just want to uh, thank the, the board for your action on item 5.10, um, extending um, you know, COVID-related uh, benefit flexibility through September. So appreciate that. Um, just briefly, I wanted to let the board know that we've transitioned um, our on-site workplace protocols to align with the state of California and Cala OSHA standards. So this means that new requirements related to, to staff who have provided information affirming that they've been fully vaccinated or other requirements for staff who are either not vaccinated or elect not to disclose their vaccina vaccination status. So we have um, different protocols for those two different sort of categories of folks. Um, and we've continued to be uh, to encourage um, all of our staff 
um, to go ahead and get vaccinated if they haven't been already. So as of now, we have about um, 133 employees. So that's over half of our employees um, and uh, directors uh, who have provided documentation on their vaccination status. Others have either not yet responded or have declined to state their status. And um, on that note, just wanna thank those directors who have provided your vaccination status and we encourage all the directors to do so. Simply send me an email or our manager, our HR manager, Jennifer Salito, an email with a photo of your vaccination card, that'd be helpful. Um, we remain on track <clears throat> to begin voluntary reofficing for employees who wish to do so and who are able to work more efficiently and more productively in their sort of traditional work setting. Um, and that will begin next week. Um, we don't expect a large influx of staff, but we'll begin um, providing for the ability for those staff to return next week. And we're also continuing to plan for a general re-officing um, right now, still targeting September, but we continue to coordinate closely with the Alameda County Health Department um, and also um, follow the developments of the state in Cal OSHA and local schools uh, so that we can adjust our planning as needed. Uh, and we're also on pace to return to in-person board meetings, um, also likely to start in September um, at the September regular board meeting. And we're providing to, uh, we're planning to provide for um, remote participation by the public should they choose to do so. So just a quick update on where we are with COVID-19. That completes my report. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, are there any questions or comments from directors? Um, one quick thought on the board returning. Will the board also be able to uh, attend remotely? Uh, I believe the uh, the governor's um, uh, declaration that provided for remote meetings um, uh, has been will be um, has been withdrawn effective the end of September. So um, I believe uh, the board would need to convene in. Um, in person, unless you meet all of the requirements in the Brown Act related to participating remotely, um, as there have been cases in the past. But so I would I would expect that the board would convene in person in September. And that remote um, attendance in the past was viewed as by telephone only, but I assume that could also be video zoomed if we have the ability if we have the proper notification and someone has their um, a laptop. Well, we can look into the specifics further if there's interest, but I can um, ask Mr. Miyaki if he has any comments at this point. Yeah, um, I was just looking for whether the uh, expiration of the governor's executive order happened September 1st or September 30th. I can't remember off the top of my head. If it's September 30th, then the board would still have the ability to participate remotely under the current standards until the executive order is officially terminated, um, suspending the teleconference requirements of the Brown Act. After they're suspended, then all of the teleconferencing rules would apply. Um, we would need to look into um, whether if a board member wants to participate by teleconference, whether they can do so by Zoom. My, my gut is probably so, as long as you're meeting all the requirements, which would mean that the teleconference location must be accessible to the public, it must be identified on the agenda, must be publicly accessible. Um, so all of those requirements would apply. But my gut is whether you phone in or zoom in, as long as those requirements are met, it would be okay. But we can look into that a little bit further if you'd like. Yeah, and I, I'd also encourage the board to consider um, when we're bringing um, staff back into the office and um, resuming on-site work, um, it would be, I think, beneficial for the board to show the same um, uh, leadership with regard to staff's return. I mean, we have seen um, issues where school districts have struggled with, say, um, staff and teachers and so forth um, 
uh, having to return and, and school board members um, not doing that. So um, just from a uh, um, overall engagement morale standpoint, I think it'd be beneficial. So uh, that, that was all for that item, President Akbari, unless there are other questions or comments. I, I do, we do have one other general manager's report. Let's, uh, let's roll into that. Okay, and this is just a brief report by um, the manager of water resources, Laura Heides. Thanks, Mr. Stevenson. This is just a quick note that next Friday, July 16th, the district and several partner organizations will be conducting a coordinated volunteer cleanup day at the Nile staging area. Uh, we have over 40 volunteers signed up to participate and our public affairs team has been supporting some of the sign up logistics and um, we'll, we'll have a few staff there on site that day to help out. So just wanna make the board aware of that. I think you received an email, but wanted to highlight that. Um, since it's upcoming as well. So that concludes my report. Thank you, Ms. Heides. And I will, I'll make sure I'm there as well. Great, thank you. Are there any other um, general manager's reports? No, that's all. Great, moving on to item 7.1. Uh, we have a report from three directors on Aqua's Zooming through California meeting. Why don't we start with? <gasps> Director Gunther, do you want to kick us off? Okay, I didn't hear. Um, I did uh, have an opportunity to attend both the uh, the latest drought as well as the regional meeting. And I will say the drought is real. Uh, the uh, area up on the Russian River is in a terrible stead um, and not getting better. Uh, so they're worth watching. Um, it's, it's there, right? That's what I can say. Um, I happen to have lost my notes on the, the last one, um, but uh, I did attend all, all of both of them, but the, the message is both the same, which is it's, it's bad out there right now. I'll go next. Um, I, I found that there were three presentations that were made um, from the the hydrological zone one, which is the northern western portion of California. <clears throat> and um, I'll just point out a couple of things. Uh, one of the slides here on, uh, on the drought conditions showed in the middle of May, not much effect on the Bay Area. The next slide, um, much greater encumbrance into the Sonoma and Russian River Valley all the way up to the Eel River. And then now you see in the latest slide, all of the wine country from Napa, Sonoma County and northward is all being affected. And uh, it was pointed out to us that these are, you know, the best wineries in the world, the uh, most expensive wines from California. Uh, and it was pointed out that the State Water Resources Control Board uh, suspended any further water deliveries uh, in, in the Russian River Valley and, and Sonoma. Uh, and so if you didn't have a water supply wrapped up in the middle of June, you were looking at either having to uh, uh, pick your grapes early or let them dry on the vine and have a, a, a raisin harvest in the fall. That doesn't sound really good. Um, but I remember in the depth of the drought going up to the wine country and, and, and seeing conditions that were just like that. It was horrible. Um, I have a solution for that, by the way. Uh, and Europe has done this for centuries, uh, also done and practiced in Canada. And, and that is to make these really uh, nice dessert wines um, 
from the raisins and in Canada, they even freeze everything and, and then dejuice them to make these really uh, elegant sweet dessert wines. One of my favorite is from France, it's called De Yakim, and it's been around for, like I said, centuries. So they may have to do a little bit of a transition there. The other thing that I found noteworthy is uh, the intense competition for water from uh, the marijuana industry up there and the stealing of water from the, the, the water district fire hydrants and uh, other supply outlets that are at the wineries. So the water district up there, which doesn't have a lot of money, had to go out and spend $1,000 per hydrant to put a lock on them because so much water was being stolen from the water district. Imagine us having to do that. And uh, we have, uh, what, 8,500, uh, about 8,500 fire hydrants in our district. It's a lot lower there, but imagine having to spend $1,000 per um, fire hydrant to protect your, your water. And the th third thing is, they knew this was coming a long time ago, decades ago. Uh, so I consider this kind of a man-made problem that the folks up there weren't setting aside money, planning their a capital improvement program where they could have a pipeline built from Ukiah where there is plentiful groundwater supplies and pipe the water north up into these uh, areas that are desperate for water right now. And uh, as well, it, for decades, they've studied putting a, a desalination plant up by Fort Bragg and there's never been any progress on that. That could be another solution for helping out. And I will note that uh, uh, Marin Municipal Water District, which ran out of water in the 1970s, and I remember it very well, had to build a pipeline over the Richmond San Rafael Bridge um, uh, to pipe water over the bridge into, into Marin. And then as soon as the drought was over, I think I pointed this out in a memo to uh, the copy director Akbari on, there's a really well-written book on, on the subject, The Man Who Made It Rain, the story of the general manager um, uh, that ran that water district. That was a gift from Patrick, by the way the book. And um, uh, after the drought was over, he recommended keeping that pipeline. And the community was in an uproar because they thought it would only lead to more development. And every major environmental group came out and said no. And then they threw all the board members out and elected an entirely new slate of board members and threw the general manager out. I mean, just what a reversal of fortune that was. And now they're having to, to build the pipeline again, all over again. And on top of that, Marin County is talking about building a desalination plant. Who would have thunk that? So people need to rethink some of what's going on with climate change and there are solutions if people will only plan ahead for them. I'll leave my comments at that. Thank you, I'm the third. Um, it appears the theme of the month, uh, attending Water Education Foundation, Water Now Alliance, et cetera, was the capture of stormwater and then utilizing that to recharge the groundwater basin. As I listened to the, uh, the presentations, two areas in our area came to mind. One was the ability to capture stormwater in the Sonol area when we have uh, water coming down the creek and, and volume and bringing it down to the Niles Canyon Aqueduct to recharge the aquifer. Currently, we're seeing significant flows in Alameda Creek, but we're not able to divert from Alameda Creek at this time of the year. So we have a fundamental flaw in our water uh, supply policies and the ability to capture it higher up and um, when we can store it, um, and then bringing it by pipe to our um, 
reach to our Cory Lakes year round, including connecting to the South Bay Aqueduct year round, would be a huge benefit. And it's currently, unfortunately, not in our current plans, and some of that has been compromised. The next was Del Val. If you think of the Del Val uh, watershed, the ability to cap to take on the storm uh, water area of uh, capacity that's currently being allocated, not being allowed for water supply, can be easily addressed at a nominal cost as compared to um, above the river dams. The irony is, and the comment was made earlier that I supported a dam above Del Val, only if we don't have the access to the, to the watershed where we can build storm water facilities and detentions, which are not dams. They don't go, if a barrier doesn't go above 10 feet, the state dam commission doesn't get involved. And that could be controlling the heavy flood control issues uh, for a facility that was built following the 1955 Christmas floods in our area, which flooded a good portion of it. So there's some extraordinary opportunities uh, that we have that we've not exercised and hopefully we will. Thank you. President Akbari, I have a director request, if I may. Yes, please. To the staff. So this kind of builds on uh, the comments of uh, Director Weed throughout the evening and then also the N3 presentation materials. Um, going back uh, more than several years back, we were uh, um, working on a study for the reoperation of Lake Del Val. And then we in fact gave reports at the California Water Commission when they were looking at the distribution of the, uh, the, the bond money from Prop 1 and um, looking for projects to fund. But they made a determination to only go after the largest projects back then. But in the meetings that Director Weed and I attended and I, I and certain number of staff too over a period of months, we got really positive feedback on what we said in our arguments that the California Water Commission with their exercise of all these different bond monies needed to look at more modest size um, projects and reoperation of reservoirs throughout the state. And we got positive feedback from the commissioners and from the DWR staff that was there. Although they, they you know, steered toward funding the, the most, the largest projects with the bond money. So they're looking at uh, smaller projects once again, and not only from, from uh, Prop 1, but from um, bond money that's available across a, a set of other bonds. And so I would like to encourage us to, um, 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 look at uh, completing that study. And I know you were a little fresh on the board when you started, um, Director Akbari, but you were the swing vote that um, killed the progress of that uh, uh, study from being completed. And um, I thought we were really well on our way toward getting it done. I know there was about a million dollar cost that was associated with it, but I really think that uh, uh, we need to complete that study. I would recommend that this be brought to the Water Resources Committee um, for an initial study and then brought back to the board for a complete discussion. So, um, if I could add briefly to that. The $100 million proposal we had for the reoperation of Del Val could include in the revised proposal, the acquisition of the watershed, having it fully funded by the state taxpayers. Prop one still has some money available and they're looking at funding some small projects because a number of the big projects, including Bryant, um, are in trouble. Sites is another. The 
uh, the Prop 1 allowed 100% funding of reservoir reoperations. You did not have to do any, potentially any matching funds. So that was $100 million. Second, the study that we did, and I a little, a little slight correction here because I voted to drop it as well when they ran up the cost of a million dollars, but I would suggest that we need to revisit the approach we use. We hired an engineer named Ford to replicate studies that were done when the dam was built. We later found, discovered that those studies existed and, um, already, and all we had to do was copy them. They had not been lost from the dam building. Uh, had been held, your engineering geologists hold on to everything. And those studies were out there for local uh, resources. So that would be one of the water supply initiatives that would make this district drought immune. And hopefully we can pursue it at no cost to the repairs. So thank you for the request. Um, I think this is something we can take to the Water Resources and Conservation Committee. We can bring the committee up to speed as to sort of where we left off um, and kind of revisit the prior study work and, um, and then have a discussion about where to go from there. So we can definitely do that. And uh, Mr. Stevenson, I really think we need this study completed urgently because we're going to go through the business case analysis for um, Los Vaqueros Reservoir Expansion. And I think we really need to understand what the trade-off costs are um, in our commitments between these two different reservoirs. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we're definitely, for Los Vaqueros, we're definitely preparing to fully inform the board as to everything um, uh, that we've been working on to date, uh, including our best assessment as to business case and so forth. So, um, so to have this uh, review of Del Val um, done in the context of that uh, might be helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are there any other director's comments under item seven? Um, actually, I would like to point out, Director Sethi was absolutely right on the uh, the marijuana grow issue. I forgot to mention that. That was very apparent. And something, while we're very much of an urban area, um, th that, that area, that crop, whatever you want to call it, apparently is very water thirsty and is there he's correct they're literally having to put locks on their fire hydrants and fence in ponds um the other issue they are behind he was correct there too they had stuff they had projects including a desal plant there are a couple rail lines that they're looking to use um, i'm familiar with both of them uh it'll be difficult but you know rail lines provide wonderful right-of-ways um but that one rail line does have some issues, but that's beside the point. The, the real issue there really was they didn't plan, they're in terrible straits, and the marijuana grows are just magnifying the problem at the moment. Um, that's it. I have, I have one more item. Yeah. Um, sure. In the last two days, I received a telephone call from a director of the Valley Water District, and he was, wanted to engage a discussion uh, myself and another director of ACWD and the president of their board and himself on um, the Los Vaqueros joint power agreement and the and more particularly the uh, pipeline only option. I suggested that we bring staff and get them involved in this and uh, directed it to uh, and he, they have agreed that if there is any discussion of that nature it would enjoy, involve staff, and I relate that to uh, our general manager. The other additional request was that they bring in other parties, including Zone 7 and even San Francisco Bosca relationship to discuss the alternatives. The concern I have, and I think they shared, is that the draft JPA does not address the other alternatives other than full participation 
and that the cost analysis done by Bartel Wells, which we supervised, does not address the options of a pipeline, uh, transfer pipeline only, or a transfer pipeline with limited storage uh, to support it. Um, so that is there. I, is, I hope that the board would be supportive of um, possibly the board president and I, the president, vice president, getting in that type of the discussion with other board members with the concurrence and participation of staff. Thank you. Thank you, Director Weed. Uh, any other comments from the board? Hearing none, we will move on to our closed session and I will read us out into both of our items tonight. Item 8.1, pursuant to California Government Code Section 54957.6, Conference with Labor Negotiators, the agency designated negotiators are Ed Stevenson, Jennifer Salito, Jonathan Wunderlich, and Stacy Q. And the employee organizations are the Operating Engineers Local 3 and the ACWD Operators Association. Item 8.2, pursuant to California Government Code, Section 54956.8, Conference with Real Property Negotiators. The property under consideration is the N3 Cattle Company, consisting of 131 parcels and approximately 50,535 acres in Alameda County, Santa Clara County, San Joaquin County, and Stanislaus County. The assessor's parcel numbers were furnished by the owners as representative and are attached to the agenda. The agency negotiator is Ed Stevenson. The negotiating parties are the N3 Cattle Company, LLC, Wren Jr. and Wren Jr. Trust. And under negotiation are the price and terms of payment. And with that, we'll move to closed session. Wonderful. Uh, can you also bring up the agenda, please? Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, it is 10.59 p.m. and the board is reconvening into open session. We've concluded items 8.1 and 8.2. Item 8.1, pursuant to California Government Code, Section 54957.6, Conference with Labor Negotiators, Agency designated nego negotiators are Ed Stevenson, Jennifer Salito, Jonathan Wunderlich, and Stacy Q. And the employee organizations are the Operating Engineers Local 3 and ACWD Operators Association. And no action was taken on this item. Item 8.2, pursuant to California Government Code, Section 54956.8, Conference with Real Property Negotiators. Property under consideration is the N3 Cattle Company consisting of 131 parcels and approximately 50,535 acres in Alameda County, Santa Clara County, San Joaquin County, and Stanislaus County. Assessor's parcel numbers were furnished by the owners as representative and are attached to the agenda. The agency negotiator is Ed Stevenson and the negotiating parties are the N3 Cattle Company, LLC, Wren Jr. and Wren Jr. Trust under negotiation are the price and terms of payment, and the majority of the board gave direction to our agency negotiators. That concludes our closed session. Moving on to item 9.1, consideration of terms and conditions for a successor memorandum of understanding between the Alameda County Water District and the ACWD Operators Association. And I will turn it to Jennifer Solito for this item. Thank you, President Ekbari. And so I have a um, little speech that I will read out because I want to be sure that the terms and conditions of the successor MOU um, are clearly heard for the board members of the public and for the record. Um, so related to item 9.9, 9.1, the district has been in negotiations with the ACWD Operators Association, also referred to as the OA, towards a successor memorandum of understanding since January of this year. The current MOU has been in effect from July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2021. 
The parties were successful in reaching a tentative agreement towards the terms and conditions of a successor MOU during the bargaining process, and the terms and conditions have been ratified through an association membership vote on June 29th, 2021. During closed session item 8.1, the board discussed the terms and conditions of the tentative agreement. And the following is a summary of the key terms and conditions and the economic impacts of the agreement. The term would be from July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2024. In terms of changes towards the MOU, the standby pay rate would increase from $90 to $110 for each 24-hour standby shift. Related to the sick leave bonus, this bonus would be eliminated in exchange for an increase in four hours of floating holiday time per fiscal year for a new total of 36 hours of floating holiday per fiscal year. Regarding active employee medical benefits, effective with benefit plan year 2022, the dual coverage benefit receives a one-time adjustment to 50% of the current calendar year 2021 Kaiser rates for new benefit amounts of $406.82 for employee only, $832.64 for employee plus one dependent, and $1,057.73 for employee plus one, plus family. Effective for the benefit plan year 2022, employees who enroll in health coverage and select a plan with a premium lower than the flex dollar allowance, which is unchanged from the term of the MOU, will receive the remainder as compensation, capped at 75% of the corresponding eligible dual coverage benefit. The corresponding maximums are as follows. $305.11 for employee only, $610.23 for employee plus one dependent, and $793.30 for employee plus family. Towards implementation of the district's 2020 classification and compensation study, effective the pay period following board adoption, all associated association represented classifications shall be adjusted to meet the 75th percentile of the compensation study and associated internal classification links. If market adjustments result in a classification range increase of less than 3%, incumbents in those classifications will receive the equivalent adjustment of 3% and a lump sum payment to occur in November of 2021. Employees hired prior to July 1st, 2021 with salaries at or over the 75th percentile will have their existing salaries frozen until future general cost of living increases applied to the classification salary schedules exceed their existing salary. Classifications that are ineligible for a general cost of living increase due to exceeding these adjusted salaries will receive a lump sum cash payment equivalent to the annual COLA received by the adjusted classification salaries up to the adjusted classification salary range. Lump sum payments will occur in November of each fiscal year. The proposed classifications Classification changes will be discussed as part of a meet and confer process that will also involve discussion of the process to promote from the journey level to the advanced classifications. Regarding wages and general cost of living adjustment, there is no general cost of living adjustment for fiscal year 21-22. Effective the pay period that includes July 1st, 2022, all association classification pay will increase by 3%. And effective the pay period that includes July 1st, 2023, all association classification pay will be increased by 2.75%. Regarding a Me Too clause, if the operating engineer's local number three, also known as OE3, reaches agreement with the district and receives a benefit that exceeds the negotiated benefit for the association in any of the following areas, the association shall receive the same benefit. The areas include implementation of the 2020 classification and compensation study, market percentile placement, and lump sum payments for fiscal year 21-22, general cost of living increases for fiscal year 22-23 and 23-24, flex dollar contribution to active employee medical benefits, and the dual health coverage benefit. And there are other amendments with which are administrative and non-substantive in nature, are also included in the successor memorandum of understanding. So these represent the key economic and business terms that would be changing from the current or a past MOU. These terms and conditions of the tentative agreement are within the parameters of board direction to district labor negotiators 
as such staff recommends that the board adopt the terms and conditions as outlined for, for successor MOU with DOA. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Salido. Are there any questions or comments from members of the board on this item? Is there a formal resolution to go along with this? There is not. It would just be a vote um, from the board and then staff will work on developing the MOU document. Okay, I will make the motion to... Uh, uh, before we do so, I do wanna open it up for questions or comments from members of the public. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, are there any members of the public who wish to make a, a comment or ask a question on this item? Hearing none, I'll turn it back to you direct. Oh, uh, Mr. Nishimura. Yes, uh, could you please, uh, Ms. Salido, could you please repeat the, sec uh, the section related to the case where the employee's salary is greater than the 75th percentile? Yes, let me, um, so for, for this first year, for fiscal year 21, 22, there is no COLA, it will just be the market adjustments, but if the market adjustment results in a range increase of less than 3% for, um, this coming, for this current fiscal year, then incumbents in those classifications would receive the equivalent adjustment up to 3% and a lump sum payment. Um, and then for employees hired prior to July 1st, 2021, whose salaries are currently at or over 75th percentile, they will have their existing salaries frozen until future general cost of living increases, which are applied to the sort of the standard, the new base ranges, exceed these existing frozen salary ranges. And then in those situations where classifications are not eligible for a COLA increase due to being above the adjusted ranges, they would receive a lump sum cash payment equivalent to the annual COLA um, and those would occur in November. So that last section, the equivalent to the annual COLA would apply for fiscal year 22, 23 and 23, 24. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, any other questions or comments from members of the public? Hearing none, I'll turn it back to you, Director Sethi. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me say, I want to acknowledge um, our entire team of uh, um, operators and, uh, that are part of the Operators Association. This is a very talented pool of people that we have. We're honored to have them work for the district. Um, I think all of us on the board want to offer um, a fair compensation, equitable compensation, com you know, competitive with the, the Bay Area market. And so I'm sad, um, uh, pleased to uh, um, support item 9.1 and the staff recommendation to approve consideration of terms and conditions for a successor memorandum of understanding between the Alameda County Water District and the ACWD Operators Association. Do we have a, a second? I will second. Great. Director Weed? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Wong? Aye. Sethi? Aye. And Akbari? Aye. That concludes item 9.1. And with that, at 11.10 p.m. tonight, we will uh, adjourn tonight's meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all.